Hello, good morning, afternoon, evening, whenever you are in your week so far. For me, it's Monday evening, just gone half past eight. I hope your Decembers have been going well. I hope your weeks have been going well so far. I hope you all had a lovely weekend. It's getting quite cold here. I can scarcely believe that it's nearly Christmas. And this is also our very last history news of the year. I am I am bereft, but we will carry on next year. More fun things to come. Let's say hello to everybody who is joining live. Thank you so much for taking the time. If you are watching this on the playback, I am very grateful, as always. And hello, Steve. Lovely to see you. Thank you for joining. Hello, Shane. Yes, they are. It's currently bedtime. So if you hear protestations from my small son, he is going through a phase of thinking that sleep is for the week. It's It's been a testing time for all concerned. <laughs> Mostly him, I think. Good morning from New Zealand. Thank you for joining. Hamilton, Ontario. Thank you so much for joining. Hope everybody is going to have a lovely festive season uh, whatever you have planned. Yes, he did have a lovely birthday, I believe. Oh, I know, just knocked that. I've been rearranging my bookshelves. The video for this week, it's the long-awaited bookshelf tour. It's happening. Uh, it's also, <laughs> it was chaotic, I'm not going to lie. Uh, and I hope that I come across as coherent because, frankly, when I saw the pile of books on the floor, I was I was not in a good place. <laughs> not in a good place so that's gonna be friday's video is a, is a tour of my of my bookshelves hello to everybody thank you all so much for joining um please yes if you're if you're if you're a a regular attender do do a do do a like as well uh if you are make sure you're subscribed now's a great time just make sure that you are subscribed you haven't been unsubscribed against your will that you've got the bell hit and then also you have selected all in the drop down that will appear. I do hope that you got notifications for this. And um, if you did not, then maybe you should check out my website, www.katrinamarchant.com. And if you go onto the contact page, there is a little box where you can put your email address in and then you can be added to my mailing list. If you I, I do get notifications if things bounce back. So far, nobody's emails are bouncing back. So if you've not if you think you've signed up and you have not seen an email from me, maybe you should check your spam slash junk folder and make sure that you haven't been rerouted by accident. So hopefully uh, we will start the new year with everybody getting the notifications that they want. We do have some updates, some repatriation decolonization news. We, of course, have our new news. We have a ding dong and we do have some events and exhibitions. So I am going to jump in. As always, though, we are going to be starting with some thank yous because these stories were sent to me by you lovely lot, for which I am always incredibly grateful. And I just always think whenever I see news items drop into my notifications or my inbox that somebody has been going about their life and they've spotted something and it's made them think of me and then it's on top of that made them take the time to send it to me and I am so very grateful for that so thank you very much. I will be recording my Q&A this week. So if you haven't seen the community tab post, then do head over there. If you've got any questions for me, I will answer as many as I can. Uh, there's not very much longer left to go before I'm going to start recording. So pop them in uh, straight after this so that I will get a chance to see them. So then let us thank yous. They go to Carve Felum, to Alberta, to Jennifer to my long-suffering husband, Mr. Dr. Cat, to Kathy, Yvonne, Shane, name twin cat, Jesse, Elaine, Ellen, Carolyn, the dad of Mr. Dr. Cat. Thank you very much, father-in-law, for taking the time. Joseph, Steve, and Rebecca, thank you all so much. Here is what I have been sent this month so far. This is an update. <laughs> This is what that Roman ding-dong wind chime may have looked like. So as you can see, what we have there is, is a winged phallus 
with bells on. Which I cannot tell you how much I want to put one of those outside of my house just to see what my neighbours would think. So that is that is what it looks like. And and it's almost imperceptible until you take a until you take a closer look and you're like, no, no. That, that is a flying phallus. This was when I saw it, I was like, Liz, I've got to say, my my sentiments exactly. This is I need that, I need that in my life. <laughs> There are what's been in the updates a lot. There's a few stories. I'm going to just run through them. As always, these are linked on my Opera pin board, which is tagged in the description box. You will also notice that there are numbers on the bottom of these slides. They do correspond with the numbered list of news stories that are also linked in the description box. Most of these updates are Parthenon marbles related. So we have this from the BBC, which is a film a little short film, about just over a minute long, with the Greek Prime Minister talking about how the Elgin marbles being in the UK, or rather the Parthenon marbles being in the UK, I very much doubt that he called them the Elgin marbles, let's just put that there, uh, would be like cutting the Mona Lisa in half. This diplomatic situation has really ramped up. I, My opinion is that it is being heavily fumbled by the party that is currently in government i i think it's it's been absolutely embarrassingly mishandled and i will show you why because this is why prime minister rishi sunak cancels a meeting with the greek prime minister because of a row over the parthenon marbles the greek prime minister has said that he was quote the Deeply disappointed by the abrupt cancellation of the meeting. This came a day after Mr. Mitsotakis told the BBC's Laura Kinsberg that the marble should be returned, as having some of the artefacts in London and the rest in Athens was like cutting the Mona Lisa in half. <clears throat> so the Greek Prime Minister then told reporters on Monday evening that the meeting had been cancelled mere hours before its slated time. He said, quote, those who firmly believe in the correctness and justice of their positions are never hesitant to engage in constructive argumentation and debate. Greece and Britain share a long-standing ties of friendship and the scope of our, of our bilateral re relations is extensive. Our positions on the matter of the Parthenon sculptures are well known. I had anticipated engage, engaging in a discussion with my British counterpart on this issue, as well as addressing significant global challenges such as the situations in Gaza and Ukraine, the climate crisis and migration. So essentially, my, un, my reading of this situation is that Rishi Sunak has scored an enormous own goal here. Because in throwing his toys out of the pram over the Parthenon sculptures, he has missed the opportunity to do diplomacy. And frankly, what do we pay his wages for if not to represent our country in a way that makes our sa us, us safer and, and benefits us on the global stage? This is an absolute... I am... I'm frequently embarrassed by the nonsense that goes on by those in, in positions of power. But this is so embarrassing. In fact, yeah, do you know what? Maybe I should have moved this to ding dong. This is ding dong levels of own goals. It is unbelievable to me that this has been allowed to happen. What? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, the way in which the tentacle what started off my understanding is and this this happened when i was you know still at school so i, I don't i i don't understand the full the full uh, remit of it but my understanding is in essentially making museums free a great initiative what that has permitted is that museums that are broad scopes free like the british museum the vna the natural history museum the science museum the list goes on and on they are state funded so that means that dcms the department for culture media and sport i believe there might be another letter in the acronym now have their tentacles well and truly in and just like 
the recent thing where Bristol University was talking about dropping the national anthem from graduation ceremonies. Well, the national anthem was never in my graduation ceremony. So I don't know. I don't know what it would be doing there anyway. That's not what we necessarily do in this country. It's there for sport, royal events. I didn't know. I've never sung the national anthem as part of something either at school or university. Very odd to me. The threats to try and defund Bristol University because the government doesn't like that is utterly baffling and a massive amount of overreach. And the same thing is happening in our museums. A senior Conservative source said, quote, it became impossible for this meeting to go ahead following commentary regarding the Elgin marbles prior to it. Why was it impossible? It, it cannot possibly be a shock <laughs> that the Greek Prime Minister thinks the Parthenon sculpture should be back in Athens. That cannot be a surprise to anybody. Let alone, did they expect him to come here and um, doff his cap and pull on his forelock and do like a diligent little boy uh, and uh, pay attention to his betters. That's not going to happen, babe. That's not going to happen. However, uh, Mr Mitsotakis, the Greek Prime Minister, did meet the Labour leader, Keir Starmer. The Conservative argues that it was, it was naive of the Labour leader to meet the Greek Prime Minister, given the public view he expressed on the future of the marbles on Sunday. Labour's view is they wouldn't stand in the way of a loan agreement between the British Museum and Athens if one was arranged. Um, a Labour source said their position was long-standing. A Labour government would not change the law to allow the sculptures to be permanently moved, which I think is also foolish. Uh, he, but they did call Mr Sunak's behaviour pathetic. Another source said, quote, what a bizarre piece of culture war theatre. A Labour spokesperson said, quote, if the Prime Minister isn't able to meet with a European ally with whom Britain has important economic ties, this is further proof he isn't able to provide the serious economic leadership our country requires. Keir Starmer's Labour Party stands ready. As with so many things, this desperate need to cling on to the Parthenon sculptures just makes this country and its institutions look more feeble and weaker in the eyes of multiple individuals, both at home and abroad. If this is just a clattering mistake. The British Museum's Chair of Trustees, George Osborne, who is the former Chancellor, has previously said he is looking to find, quote, some kind of arrangement to allow some of the sculptures to spend some of their time in Greece. Speaking to the Culture, Media and Sport Committee in October, Mr Osborne said any deal would have to see, quote, objects from Greece coming here for the first time. <laughs> Cute. Uh, it's thought that any decision is at least months away. Well, hopefully there'll be an election before that. We can get, get over this nonsense. Yes, the making of copies is we've we've definitely talked about that on this channel. In fact, people have gone in and three D scanned them. They they are currently printing copies. Copies are available, and also let's be abundantly clear: people are very happy to stand in front of copies. Very happy. When Dippy was in the great the big uh, Hints Hall at the Natural History Museum, people came from miles around to take photographs with Dippy. There are, to my knowledge, about five Dippies. They're all casts. People are very happy to come and stand in front of a cast in a museum. So it, it, this could absolutely happen. And on top of that, there are so many artefacts in the basement of the British Museum. We could completely gut the Marbles uh, Gallery we could set it up as a temporary ex exhibition space. And maybe if we showed ourselves, if the British Museum showed itself to be cle clear and willing to engage in repatriation, in decolonisation, global museums would be chomping at the bit to send their exhibitions to us. Visiting exhibitions, travelling exhibitions, 
are really what draw in the money. So it's it's just it's just baffling to me. You you have a dippy in Pittsburgh outside the Museum of Natural History, and at this time of year he gets a dawn with a long scarf. Ex absolutely, I think there was talk because they're redoing the outside of the Natural History Museum. There was talk that maybe the dippy cast might end up out there, or perhaps might be recast in bronze and placed out of there. Oh, don't be sorry. I tell you what, if you want to be your lullaby, there is in fact a playlist. <laughs> of these videos, the history news from all of 2023, the lives, that will see you well through to morning. So uh, please watch them all. If you're asleep, then the ads will run. <laughs> feel free, feel free to have a kip. Sleep well. <laughs> yes, it's very cute, isn't it? Uh, to uh, to allow some of the sculptures to spend some of their time in Greece. The the alternative is as well, if there was some kind of move towards this, having the ownership transferred or recognised appropriately doesn't necessarily mean that the items go back in all of the cases. I believe that that is the case with some of the Benin bronzes in the British Museum, that there is not an immediate call for everything lock, stock and barrel to be sent back. There are ways and means, long-term loans, all of those sorts of things. There are there are so many ways that this conversation could go, but the digging the heels in and just being like a dog with its favourite chew toy is so weird to me. So weird to me. Exactly, particularly when you're in a museum space like the British Museum where entry to these permanent galleries is free. So... The way you profit is by making more temporary gallery space because then you can charge those exhibitions. Freeing up space in a museum, particularly a publicly funded museum, makes loads of sense to me. But, you know, uh, it doesn't stop there, friends. <clears throat> so we've got another one. The Greek Prime Minister was, was annoyed by the cancellation of the meeting with the British Prime Minister, Prime Minister over the Parthenon marbles. This is just going to this is going to run and run. Um, and. So there are quite a few news items about this. Equally, the Parthenon marbles, the fact that. A, the, National Museum of, the National Museum of Denmark has also refused requests from the Acropolis Museum in Athens. According to the Danish Museum's director, the sculptural fragments are of greater importance to the National Museum than if they were sent to Greece, noting that the majority of the surviving Parthenon sculptures are divided between London and Athens, and the three fragments in Copenhagen have, quote, one particular role for Danish cultural history. So essentially, they're saying that because other people are keeping hold of theirs, they aren't going to give theirs back. So this is it, this is it's just polluting the conversation. I heard somebody somebody said, and it's just a rumor at this point, that there was there is a large exhibition. I don't want to name the thing in case this is in case this rumor is false. But there is a large scale display that is of importance to English history, to British history, and there is talks about refusing anybody who is not an EU citizen with an EU passport access to see this until the British Museum sends the Parthenon sculptures back. So that's not even a case of not doing loans. That is about essentially people who have a British passport going to an exhibition and being refused entry because of these actions. So there is this this is going to have a long tentacles of a problem. I mean I think I certainly think about the items and I there are I'm no doubt there are items that are officially on loan of course all 
all of those, lots of those items are not in fact on loan. They were looted and now need to return. I absolutely yes. This is I. This is where I stand, and I I also think that there is an element to which, particularly with certain artifacts, divorcing it, and it's actually with a lot of artifacts, divorcing them from their cultural heritage, and denying them the full cultural context by keeping them separate is in fact an act of of damage it is to me cultural vandalism so yeah i will point out that the the the, the thing that i'm talking about the exhibition that i'm talking about is in france so they also did their own fair share of of looting and pillaging however they are also in the process of repatriating repatriating an awful lot of things so yes this is a opinion piece simon jenkins this <laughs> I'm just going to read it because I think it's delightful. The Parthenon Marbles row is beyond silly. Rishi Sunak screeches, mine, mine, like a child in a playground. He refuses a cup of tea with the Greek Prime Minister, Kyriakos Mitsotakis. The leader of the opposition laughs. The nation yawns. Polls show over half are happy to see the marbles returned and just over 20% want them to say. Any civilised Briton knows they should be displayed where they belong, in their former home of Athens. But what fun it is to think up smart reasons why this should never happen. Sunak's quest for a daily headline gets more frantic by the day. There was something synthetic about Monday's incident. Mitsotakis is referenced to the separated marbles being like the Mona Lisa cut in half might be over the top. But as any visitor to Greece knows... What to Britain is a boring scholastic quarrel is to Greeks a burning sense of grievance that will not go away. This is an asymmetrical row. Of course, Britain has legal title to the statutes, statues, but laws can be changed. They have legal title because they wrote the laws to make him have legal title. Of course, Lord Elgin probably saved them from destruction, though they were later damaged in cleaning. Of course, repatriating them might be a precedent you don't want to make uh, if you don't want to make it so, but not if you don't. It's true that more people see the marbles in London than they would in Athens, but they do not see them complete. And so what? We're not moving the pyramids to London for a bigger show. It continues. This is how the article ends. None of these millions of objects was created to be locked away in perpetuity in a London basement. Most were made in far off countries whose citizens might be proud to display them in public. There is nothing sacred about a museum. It is an unnatural place to leave thousands of objects frozen in time and place, vulnerable to theft and decay. Museum walls are now crumbling, ideologically if not physically. France has a major programme for repatriation of imperial objects, whether looted or not. So does Germany. Despite concerns over security, African bronzes are returning to Africa, ceramics to Southeast Asia, tribal treasures to Polynesia. This does not mean the death of the Louvre. The V&A's director, Tristram Hunt, this week froze to reform of the 1983 National Heritage Act and that at present curbs certain museums from de-acquisitioning. He wants them to grow up and take charge of their own business. The truth is that most museums have too much stuff, far too much. They should distribute it to the rest of the world. Returning the Parthenon marbles might indeed be a precedent, an excellent one. And I agree. I agree. And we are also the topic of, I'm not sure, to be honest, what is being mocked in the onion, whether it is the request for repatriation or the British Museum for not doing it. Here is the Onions article. Facing numerous calls for the institution to finally make amends for historical wrongs, the British Museum was under pressure Tuesday to return a looted Hello Kitty phone case to a mall kiosk. Quote, it's long past 
time for the British Museum to atone for its sins and return this novelty Hello Kitty phone case to its rightful home at the kiosk in the centre of Mantry Square Mall in Bengaluru, India, said activist Siobhan Keogh, noting that the British Museum had not even issued a formal acknowledgement of the fact that Queen Elizabeth II had shoplifted the iPhone 6 case in the shape of the popular anthropomorphic cat character in 2015. I mean... It is, yes, it is, it is satire, but I'm not 100% sure what they're taking aim at. Are they taking aim at the cause for repatriation, or are they taking aim at the refusal for repatriation, or is it both? I wonder. Either way, the British Museum is front and centre in being ridiculed in this. Sometimes I have to be like, they started doing serious journalism. <laughs> it could well be. I have to double check things. I'm like, let me just Google this to see if it's to see if it's happened. That was my thought, but then it was, but the fact that they're doing it over a Hello Kitty phone case, it sort of, I think there's a potential secondary meaning that maybe they didn't intend. That it feels like. They're they're mocking the other side of the argument too. Maybe they are, and, and and actually, in some ways, I think this is vitally important. But when you do think about all of the things that are going on in the world currently, the fact that this argument over not having tea, two prime ministers not having tea, two enormously privileged men not having tea, that that filled up so many column inches in press. Maybe everyone needs to give their head a little wobble. Maybe. I mean, she did used to have that big purse. Maybe that's what it was. <laughs> everyone said that she was, you know, carrying it here, there and everywhere. It was to pick up her Hello Kitty phone cases. Is it just me who's, who's such a weird little fact checker that I'm like, iPhone 6 case in 2015. When was the iPhone 6 released? I'm sure they did their research. <laughs> oh. A Greek sculpture, Greek sculptor, sorry, has created protest works for the return of the Parthenon sculptures. This sculpture, Manilos Harkotsis, lives and works a few kilometres from Her Heraklion. And his work, he has set up representations of archaeological sites in public and private spaces. He says, quote, they are protest sculptures for the violent removal of ancient works of art from our country, for antiquities, but also for the need to protect the archaeological sites of Greece. Don't be embarrassed. I think that there are these there are things that come to us um exhibition wise or plays that we feel incredibly connected to and we want to go and see them. It you know, it really it really matters. And and that's why I think in some ways which we talked about earlier, that kind of holding hostage of things. And because, of course, these items can't go on loan anywhere because of their contested nature now. So they just have to moulder away, not being... Nothing can be done with them. There's not even really the space to reinterpret them. They have to be kind of preserved in aspic because they're now so contested. In 2006, this sculptor created an installation entitled, quote, Process, which refers to the ruins of a temple. It was made of ashlar, which I'm not quite sure what that is, and the representation is so convincing that many people were left confused as whether it was a modern work of art or a temple that had been nearly destroyed. His most characteristic work is called Return, which he created in 2011, and it's an ionic-style marble column and capital 
which give the impression of falling. From then on, he creates forms that refer to unfurling capitals. He quote, I make ionic columns and capitals which are like unrolled papyri. Thus, I attempt to show the spread of Greek culture worldwide and in an abstract sense that sculptures must return to where they belong in Greece. With the return of the sculptures, i.e. with the restoration of justice, the unwrapped form will return to its place so that harmony can come. The sculptor from Crete noted that the Western world invokes the Republic, which was actually born in Greece. The times when in which the ancient sculptures were created, which were forcibly taken from our country. So in the name of the Republic, these sculptures must be returned to their natural places. I have no doubt that we're going to see a ramping up of these updates. I think that there's there's been a kind of spike in things. We will see what happens when the Greek, Greek Prime Minister returns to Greece and how the news media deals with that. I think, yes, and the and the, the check out the article because there are some photographs of his pieces, but they, they are absolutely fa fantastic and very beautiful. My husband and I made a video about AI and its potential dangers. We now I'm I'm updating it, even though it wasn't, wasn't a news piece, because we did talk about AI, and there is this article on how AI could reveal secrets of thousands of hand, handwritten documents, from medieval manuscripts to hieroglyphics. The hope is that use the use of AI might assist with the digitization of manuscripts, which can make the collections in libraries accessible at the click of a button. However, to do this, currently to do this work, to decode, decrypt, translate these texts requires so many, many years of training. Um, but if we have a machine that can do that sort of learning and do that translation work, obviously it will, for a long time, require a set of human eyes to check over it, to, to make sure that it's continuing um, and that it's doing the right thing. This article says, quote, the sheer quantity of data these processes will make available has significant ramifications for scholarship. Many medieval manuscripts haven't been read since the Middle Ages. If you can hear that, I've got my lounge door open because it helps the Internet. And if you can hear that kind of rattling sound, that is my chinchilla. She's uh, she's woken up. Uh, this is the thing. We can't trust the accuracy of AI. So we are going to have to have it proofread by another set of of eyes and ears. Um, this points out many medieval manuscripts haven't been read since the Middle Ages. In the past, major questions like the date of composition of foundational works like, works like Beowulf have been resolved with the tiniest fragments of data, such as a single spelling. We're now starting to look at answering questions, such questions with data sets of tens of thousands of spellings, which HTR, with H it will be hundreds of thousands, if not millions, and answers we will get will be different. Have you met a chinchilla? You don't don't let them in a museum. It's like having that'll be like having a tribble. <laughs> don't let the tribbles in. <laughs> we do have a chinchilla. Her name is Starbuck. She is very spicy. Um she is nearly five and she's very angry. <laughs> it's very angry. Yes. Yes. 20, hour, 20 hours of sleeping, uh, 20 hours of sleeping and four hours of absolute carnage. She's got one of those big wheels um, and she likes, she likes to make noise with it. She'll stop eventually. It's fine. <laughs> Um, we're told, though, that this HTR, the data it can generate, is also richer. Over the past half millennium, the representation of medieval texts has been fundamentally constrained by the printing press and the computer keyboard, 
we're told that some medieval scribes use three different forms of S, but all have been transcribed to the familiar snake-like S on a keyboard. Marks of punctuation, like the poor punctus elevatus, which looks something like an inverted semicolon, have had to be modernised out of sight. Releasing, Realising these potential applications for the early tradition in English from the period before 1150 is the goal of a new pilot project, which is being run out of Trinity College, Dublin. It aims to use HTR to build an exclusive, exhaust, sorry, an exhaustive open access digital corpus of Old English text that transcribes all surviving Old English for the first time and in an unparalleled level of detail. The people behind this project says we're particularly excited to see how many new letter forms we discover and to gather the first substantial data on word division in Old English. Scribes did not always put spaces where we might expect. This is An Ansund is one of a number of initiatives at Trinity that aims to harness new technologies to increase access to manuscripts. The, this article finishes by saying the ethics and danger of AI have received important attention over the past year, but its power to make legible and navigable our cultural heritage also deserves attention. Someday soon, it may even ensure you can decode your muddled shopping lists. Starbuck is named after the, uh, after the Galactica character. Um, she when she came to us, she had a sister who we called Six. Sadly, though, uh, this these were an accidental litter, Starbuck and her sister and a brother as well. And you can't keep boys and girls together without spaying them or fixing them. And they're so delicate and small that actually it's not a great idea to do that. So it's just best to keep them in um, sex select segregation. Um Unfortunately, Six was an albino and I think potentially had other health concerns because the journey home stressed her too much and poor Starbuck lost her sister. Um, so then we we got her a friend who we called Athena and Athena was enormous. And it took ages to bond them, but we finally did and they were very, very happy together. But then Athena had an issue with her teeth and then very sadly with her heart. So now it is Starbuck on her own. And she is happy. She likes to be in the living room with my husband. She likes to bully him. So we did name all of our chinchillas after Battlestar Galactica characters. I know. We've we were we yes, and we did think about maybe getting her another cage mate but she was very young when we paired her with uh, Athena and it if it goes wrong it can go really badly wrong and if a chinchilla fights other chinchilla it can happen in minutes and they can do such incredible damage mm -hmm. that we just thought we'd see for a while to see if she if she was very unhappy. And when we saw that she wasn't, we thought that actually it might stress her more if we tried to pair her with somebody else. But she does get to hang out with us and we did get her a little cage buddy as well. Yeah, it was really tough and we missed them. So we were going to keep an eye on what's going to happen with AI and with uh, manuscript creation and with manuscript translation as well. We have a update. The International Council of Museums, ICOM, issued a statement on the 25th of October in which they said, quote, ICOM expressed its deep concern about the current violence affecting Israeli and Palestinian civilians and deplores the significant humanitarian consequences that the conflict has had over the past weeks. ICOM extends its sincerest condolences to those who have lost family, friends and community due to the violence. ICOM stands firm in its commitments to preserving cultural heritage and recalls the imperative of all parties to respect international law and conventions. 
including the 1954 Hague Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property in the Event of Armed Conflict and its two protocols. ICOMS warned about a potential increase in smuggling and destruction of cultural objects due to the conflict. They have cited international legal obligations to work to prevent the illicit import, export, export and transfer of cultural property, including the 1970 UNESCO Convention and the 1995 UNIDROI, UNIDROI Convention. They continued... ICOM thus expects an immediate ceasefire in respect of international humanitarian law in order to prevent further loss of human life and safeguard cultural heritage, which is essential to our collective humanity, and reaffirms its commitment to the principles of peace, understanding and unity through the preservation and protection of cultural heritage. On the 21st of October, so before it released its statement, the board of ICOM Israel and the director of museums, directors of museums in Israel, wrote a letter urging the organisation. Thank you. My husband just brought me tea. I was just talking about the chinchillas. Did you hear? I was talking about how Starbuck had sisters and then we lost them both. My husband was very sad about it too. Yes. Um. Dress Museums of Israel wrote a letter urging the organisation to take a strong stance in relation to the 7th of October massacre. The letter said, quote, although we are aware of the critiques aimed at Israel, it is crucial to stress that the hor horrific attacks carried out by Hamas, backed by Iran, have no excuse and we vehemently oppose any effort at reasoning them out. Hamas's activities amount to nothing less than, I'm not going to say those words because it will, um, it might get this uh, brought down but we I'm sure we've all read what happened we demand that ICOM condemn these acts of terror with the utmost further cultural institutions in Arab countries have voiced their support for Gaza saying quote we stand firmly in solidarity with Palestinians in the face of the devastating genocide of Gazans and the ongoing illegal Israeli occupation we will continue to use our platforms to foreground Palestinian perspectives and experiences in the struggle against settler colonialism. So on, on, on both sides, we are obviously seeing the ramping up of the rhetoric and the language. Um, and we have seen we have seen so um throughout. Um ICOM Arab confirmed to the museum's journal that two important museums in Gaza have been completely destroyed by air, Israeli airstrikes. Other museums uh, in Gaza, including the Pasha's Palace Museum, Gaza City Al Mathaf, and the Yasser Arafat Foundation, uh, in at least, and there are also eight significant archaeological heritage sites as well. Blue Shield, which is the international network that works to protect cultural heritage in times of emergency, said in a November the 1st statement, quote, while the protection of human life and dignity must always be the first priority in any crisis, protecting people and protecting their cultural heritage are indelibly intertwined. Under customary international law, all parties in the conflict must recognise that civilians and civilian objects, which includes their cultural property, are also protected and must be respected. According to Blue Shield, unverified reports suggest that there have been significant damage to heritage sites across Gaza, including the destruction of the mosque at Jab Jabalia and damage to the historic centre of Gaza. There are also reports of damage to several sites, including the Church of St. Pophyrus, and which is the oldest Christian church in Gaza. It was built in the 1150s. And there, 16 people were killed in an airstrike on October the 20th. The statement continues. Quote, under international law, all parties to conflict are expected to commit to taking all feasible actions to safeguard and respect cultural property location areas where armed conflict is taking place. Avoid using cultural property and its immediate surroundings as part of their military operations in a way that may cause or lead to damage and destruction. Avoid targeting cultural property unless there is military necessity. Prevent looting. Avoid reprisals directed at cultural property and protect and support those involved in the in the protection of cultural heritage. I uh, 
uh, find everything that I'm seeing on the news utterly devastating. I'm sure that you will do too. And I hope that we see peace as soon as possible. Continuing the updates, this is in regards to the story about the world's oldest pyramid that we covered in the last History News. Um, apparently, there is some question. The archaeologists apparently call foul on the purported discovery of a 27,000-year-old pyramid. So we heard in October there was this bombshell study that claimed that they had found in Indonesia a, quote, multi-layered prehistoric pyramid dating back thousands of years BCE, thus predating Egypt's oldest pyramid. Pyramid, Pardon me. Close scrutiny by other experts, however, is calling that research into question. In a paper published in the Archaeological Proscript Prospec Prospection, that's a really hard word, to say. Indonesian geologist Danny Hillman Nata Wijada and his fellow researchers assert that the megalithic site at Gunung Padang, which consists of five terraces, was built as this pyramid. The study concludes that these pyramid builders, quote, must have possessed remarkable masonry capabilities, which do not align with the traditional hunter-gatherer cultures. The burial of these structures around 9,000 years ago adds further intrigue for reasons that are not fully understood. But however, other archaeologists are decrying this study's finding. Quote, I'm surprised the paper was published as is. That's Flint Dibble, great name, an archaeologist at the UK's Cardiff University. Uh, Chief among his critiques are the claims that the four stone layers undergirding this, the terraces contain stonework that was meticulously sculpted, which they claim indicates a human hand. Dibble questions the paper's implication that the structure was built using, quote, sophisticated construction techniques. Speaking to Nature, he said the layers at the site could well have been the result of natural movement of rocks or weathering. Material rolling down a hill, he said, is going to, on average, orient itself. Another archaeologist called Bill Farley uh, also pointed out to the publication that there exists no evidence that this pyramid was settled or the area around it was settled by an advanced civilization during the last ice age. The site's soil samples could be dated back 27,000 years, but they don't contain trace of human activity, such as bone fragments. Uh, the paper has been proofread by Graham Hancock, has not helped its credibility. This British writer has long peddled Unsub this is a quote from the article, unsubstantiated pseudo-scientific theories regarding ancient civilizations. Lately, with his controversial 2022 Netflix docuseries, Ancient Apoly Apocalypse, in which this location uh, features in the first episode. A study has been launched, an investigation study has been launched by the publication that first published it. And the one of the study's authors has welcomed additional eyes and research on the site. He said, quote, we know very little about our human history. I honestly don't know. This is so far out of my period of expertise uh, and knowledge and also skill set. I am not an archaeologist or a geologist. I have genuinely got no clue as to where the sides sit. I am, however, always a little bit loath to when fringe theories, in quotes, fringe theories are called out by the Academy. The go-to is, well, it's sour grapes. The Academy doesn't want somebody who's not part of them finding things out. And while that may certainly be true of, of some departments, for 
I hope the majority of people who are in who are part of the academy they want to further knowledge and they want to be rigorous about doing so and they want to if you present them with evidence claiming something they are absolutely absolutely going to pull it apart pick it from pillar to post but if what you have shown them changes the way we understand the past they will accept that because that is a great find so Mr. Dr. Cat is, was an anthropologist at university. Uh, so he, of course, has he has studied a discipline that has changed with over time with, with vast ethical considerations having to alter. Well, here's the thing. It's not the media, because this was in a journal, Archaeological Prospection. So when, when the media comes across something that's published in one of those journals, there is an assumption, I think, that that's good to go. Like that is, we always talk about where's the peer review. If you find something in a journal, there is at least an assumption there's been some peer review. I have not I have not come across I think I've seen trailers for the show or maybe this ancient apocalypse thing I think I've seen adverts for it but I have not read or seen any of uh, Hancock's work I think I'm have to look into it though as it's now hitting the news and uh, MJ have a lovely time at orchestra I hope you are tuneful and melodic we have got Because he, a few, he's he's also a fluent French speaker, and he ended up there because he was working for a company that needed logistics planning and then HR and all sorts of things like that to happen, compliance more generally, and so he got additional training and certification in those things. So. That's that's this. It's it's a shortcut around the long way. Uh, repatriations. Ancient artifacts have been returned to Ukraine after a long dispute with Russia, and they do look very cool. These are what we're seeing here laid out on these black pads are gold ancient Scythian artifacts. There was a legal dispute over ownership which has gone on for almost a decade. They've been in the Netherlands. A thousand artefacts, including a solid gold Scythian helmet and gold neck ornament, were loaned to Amsterdam's Allard Pearson Museum when Russian troops seized Alex and annexed the peninsula in 2014. Both Ukraine and museums located on the Moscow-controlled territory claimed ownership rights to the pieces when this exhibition ended. The items date from when the Scythian people lived in the area between the 7th and 3rd centuries BC. So this is very interesting. It's horrible because obviously there's armed conflict involved, but it's very interesting as to what happens when a territory, its borders shift, when there was once an undisputed ownership or appropriate placement of something in a certain museum and then because of conflict a national boundary shifts and now that museum is claimed in the territory of another nation i i do i do wonder what that means um so there's been 10 years of court hearings artifacts from four crimean museums that were presented in the exhibition crimea Golden Secrets of the Black Sea in Amsterdam have been returned to the Ukraine. So this court feels that that's the answer. And the museum, this museum has returned 565 items, including ancient sculptures, Scythian and Samartan jewellery, and Chinese lacquer boxes. I'm just going to take my hairpin out because it is stabbing me in the scalp. And it is said that this collection is going to be stored in the museum until the deoccupation of Crimea. 
the Museum said the artefacts had been returned to Kiev on Sunday. Quote, this is a special case in which cultural heritage became the victim of geopolitical developments. We are pleased that clarity has emerged and they have now been returned. On Monday, however, a Kremlin spokesperson was quoted as saying that the artefacts belong to Crimea and should be there. The Moscow installed governor of the peninsula comments, commented on Telegram suggesting they should be returned by, quote, achieving the goals of the special military operation, Russia's official title for its war in Ukraine. Ukrainian Customs Service reported on Monday that a truck carrying 2,694 2, kilograms of cultural property entered the 980-year-old Kiev Pershek Lavra monastery complex, where a further identification process would take place. So it's these these legal battles I find very interesting. There's a video to check out as well. We have got uh, a story about oh that skipped that went a bit too fast. The remains of five Native Americans have been returned home after a hundred hundred and twenty years after their graves were looted. So there's a a nearly five minute video on that that is really in interesting and worth checking out. It is very good to see the these change in events happening. Oh, my husband just messaged me. Have I said something wrong? <laughs> he said that um, he he got the job because he fell asleep in a staff meeting. <laughs> he, he got volunteered as tribute. <laughs> Continuing on, we have the Virginia, Virginia Museum is returning 44 stolen or looted works to Egypt, Italy, and Turkey. Just to keep that open there so I can see what's happening. This is Virginia's state-run fine arts museum. It is returning 44 pieces of ancient art to their country's origin after law enforcement officials presented the institution with what it called, quote, irrefutable evidence that the works had been stolen or looted. Quote, the clear and compelling evidence president presented to the VMFA left no doubt that the museum does not hold clear title for these 44 works of ancient art. Stolen or looted art has no place in our galleries or collection, so we are delighted to return these works to their countries of origin. Jan Hatchett, or Hachet, a spokesperson for the museum, said on Wednesday morning that she was not permitted to answer questions from the Associated Press that pertained to the investigation. Colonel Matthew Bogdanos, whose name we have heard many times alongside DA Bragg, he is the head of the DA's Antiquity Trafficking Unit. He did not immediately respond to an emailed inquiry from the Associated Press. The VMFA had said in May that it was summoned by from DHS and the DA's office regarding 28 objects in its collection. The agencies asked the museum for documentation related to the pieces, ranging from invoices and bills of sale to import and export documents and provenance research. The museum complied and authorities then added another 29 works to the summons list, according to the news release. The DA's office have separately announced the return of 41 pieces. I think this is a different different case of, as well, valued at more than $8 million to Turkey. The news release about that made no mention of the office's efforts in connection with the Virginia Museum. So there we go. The American repatriations are going hard. We have got an individual called Morton Allport who earned his scientific reputation by grave robbing human remains and killing the soon to be extinct Tasmanian tigers 
before shipping them to Europe. We are talking here about British rural Tasmanians, Tasmania's foremost naturalist. He was, in fact, an untrained lawyer who traded stolen Aboriginal who traded stolen Aboriginal remains alongside Tasmanian tiger skins for scientific prestige. What a prince! Morton Allport, an English-born 19th-century naturalist who lived in Tasmania's capital of Hobart earned his scientific acc accolades by grave robbing human body parts and shipping them to European universities, along with the remains of Tasmanian tigers. All these activities, which include the, do you know what, I probably shouldn't say that, but the desecration of an Aboriginal man's human remains to gather evidence for pseudoscientific theories of white superiority coincided with a genocide against the island's Aboriginal peoples and the extermination of the Tasmanian tigers, which went extinct in 1936. The research, based on Allport's archive letters unearthed the State Library of Tasmania, was published in the... Oh, here we go, it's jumped. In the Archives of Natural History publication. This article goes on. The most infamous instance of Allport's grave robbing occurred when William Lan incorrectly considered the last male indigenous Tasmanian died in 1869. Lan was coveted as a prize specimen. This is this article. This is not my words. And Allport entered into fierce competition with another colonist, the Dr. William Crowther, who would later become the premier of Tasmania to acquire land's remains. The, retesque, the result was a grotesque free-for-all. Crowther and his son snuck into the hospital morgue holding land's body and cut off his head, swapping land's skull with the skull of a dead white man. Arriving late to the gory scene, Allport ordered land's feet and hands to be removed so Crowther wouldn't be able to acquire a full skeleton. What was left of land was buried the same day, but was later to have found to have been dug up and stolen. Most likely by Allport, who later admitted in a private letter that it was in his possession. I, just, and I read the rest of the article because I'll be honest, it's 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 boiling my blood. And I think that when people don't see the issue with the need to decolonize museum spaces with the need to repatriate artifacts but specifically human remains i think it's because far too often they haven't heard stories like this far too often they don't know exactly why these collections of people parts exist in old museums and, and what atrocities were done to collect them and what atrocities were perpetrated because they were used as some kind of pseudoscientific evidence for continuing those atrocities. The collections themselves are some of the darkest remnants of historical and biological work to ever be done. And in some ways, I think that there needs to be an exhibition. And I don't know how you do this because I'm fundamentally against displaying human remains, but there needs to be an exhibition confronting these collections and their formation. I don't know how, I, and I'm, I have no idea how one does that, but. Some something needs needs to be done. Scarlet, you. Oh, sorry. Um, that headline is badly researched. The native people of Australia made the move to be referred as either native or first nation Australians last year. Oh, thank you for that. I will. If I if I had known that, I would have altered the headline. I apologise. Um. If we do have anybody who is First Nations Australian, I'm very sorry. Um, 
I will remember that for next time. And I, and I when I see things like that, I, I do alter them before I read them out. Because, and also, um, thank you to anybody. Uh, thank you, Scarlett, for letting me know. And thank you to anybody who shares that information, not just for me, but for everybody. And I'm just going to hold my hands up that I, I'm going to get this stuff wrong. I will, I will get things wrong. I will misquote things. I will sometimes with these news items, I will present things and I've done it already. And then I've had to come back and say, actually news, is, new, new news has come out um, in which this is now being discredited. Like we, like we've done about that, about that pyramid. Uh, I am, I'm not going to be precious about the fact that things that I will say the wrong things and I will sometimes get information wrong and I will misunderstand things. As I said, lots of this is so far out of my period of history, but I'm always going to be apologetic when I do so. And I'm going to be particularly apologetic if I say or do something inadvertently that causes somebody distress because of their lived experience or because of a protected characteristic, because that will never be my intention. Uh, and I will always do my best to inform myself as best I can, because that is also my job. It's 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 nobody else's job to educate me. If somebody takes the time to, I'm incredibly grateful. But it's my job to to educate myself as much as I possibly can. They they you're absolute. Yes. If somebody wants to display your remains in a museum. In fact, in fact, not that long ago, somebody wrote in their will, I believe they wanted their head to be stripped of flesh and given to the RSC. And there was a whole furore about whether or not that, that skull could be used for Hamlet, which was in this person's will, notarised, seen by the family. There were questions about whether that could be displayed in that way. So, yeah, absolutely. This poor Diddums has had a very hard day. Country Angel, um, thank you. And I really, I really I appreciate you saying that. And I will always do my best. So we've got to poor little Diddums here. Who, a German art collector who's got the sads because he can't keep his ancient mask that was looted <laughs> from Egypt. Oh, he bought it himself. Um, I'm being I'm being mean with reason. So he bought it in um 2020. He bought three art objects in 2020, and he's only been allowed to keep one of them. Oopsie doopsies. Feels so sad for him. He has lost out in his attempt to retain possession of an ancient mask deemed to have been looted from Italy. Um, Italy. That doesn't even look like Italy. Egypt. A German court rejected his claim and upheld an earlier ruling. Dirk Germanden, 80, filed the lawsuit. He is old enough to know better. Filed the lawsuit against the government of North Rhine-Westphalia after authorities seized a 2,000-year-old Egyptian coffin mask and a 3,500-year-old brooch from him in 2020. The coffin mask is believed to have been looted during excavations that took place between 2011 and 2017 before it was put up for auction in, in France in 2017. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Hang on, I've just seen that comment. Um, I'm just going to finish this up. This uh, collector bought these objects at an auction in the US, and then he was uh, he was he was able to prove that the third item did not fall under the Cultural Protection Act. This law, which was passed in 2016, is aimed at combating illicit trafficking of cultural property. Judge Andreas Hurst indicated that he was open to a proposal from Gamunden, who argued the marsh should be exhibited in an institution he established with his wife. He wants his very own museum before they are returned to Egypt and disappear into some storage facility. The court decision comes as a similar 
prosecution case is winding its way through the French courts. The transitional government of Gabon, which underwent a military coup d'etat in August, has begun a legal battle for the restitution of an antique mask. The item is already at the centre of a lawsuit between an elderly couple and the antiques dealer they bought it from. Oh, this one, who believe they cheated, they cheated them out of the higher profits from its sale. I'm going to say I don't like that little quote. Judge Andreas Hurst indicated he was open to a proposal from Gamundin, who argued the mask should be exhibited in an institution that he established from his wife, with his wife, the Obentraut Three Museum. So he wants to put it in his museum before they return to Egypt and disappear, quote, into some storage facility. This is that old thing of, well, we can't trust the Egyptians to look after their own stuff, can we? We can't trust them. Much better we do it. I don't like it. I don't like it. This is the one that this is the comment I saw. There is an issue in the US about remains being donated for scientific research, ending up in what is a roadside museum? Or autopsies performed in hotel meeting rooms for huge profits. Elaine, that that sounds like are you? Are you saying that that's happening now? A museum on the side of the road, like a, like a sideshow museum? I... Okay, I... Now, okay. There, I saw a... Th I, I saw a thing on Facebook because I'm old, I'm on Facebook, because <laughs> I'm a millennial, um, an elder millennial like that. I saw a thing on Facebook about a, um autopsy show where they were solving a, a, a pre-existing crime or a, a crime we know the, we know what happens and they're basically doing an autopsy based upon a solved crime. And I had assumed that it was a acted out fake autopsy but now I'm questioning whether that's a, actually a thing that's not fake human remains. It's something else. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, yes, please. I would like to see it. I mean, I wouldn't, but I feel like I need to. I'm. There are things I need to understand. Five hundred dollars for I feel like everybody who pays that should be on a list. There needs to be we need a list of the people that are paying for that. They need to be on a list. <laughs> Not a good list. The the very, very naughty list. Oh no, absolutely not. The in this is the thing, increasingly, and I talk about this, I'm going to talk about this in my video on my bookshelves. I've got true crime books, but increasingly, and it's it's evolving as as my opinions about um human remains in museums and galleries has changed as well, that I am very, very disquieted with people profiting off of true crime in the same way that I'm very, very disquieted by people and institutions profiting off of human remains thank you Yvonne for sending that I love John Oliver I just haven't seen that episode I love his one about the British Museum <laughs> I was like watching it going yes I agree so those are the repatriations news let's move on to the new news A Tyrannosaurus Rex's last meal with two baby dinosaurs, the greedy guts. The last meal of a 75 million year old Tyrannosaur has been revealed by scientists. Researchers say the preservation of the animal and of the small, unfortunate creatures it ate shines new light on how these predators lived. It is, quote, solid evidence that Tyrannosaurs drastically changed their diet as they grew up. 
The specimen is a juvenile Gorgosaurus, a close cousin of the giant T Rex. Oh, I thought it was. My husband's just laughed. And I don't know. I don't know why he's just laughed, but I'm disturbed by it. <laughs> so, not a Tyrannosaurus Rex, a Gorgosaurus. Oh, he's coming upstairs now. Is he? Um, he's cackling downstairs like he's laughing like a drain. I don't know what he's laughing at. You always hope it's solid. What? Um, so this particular Gorgosaur was around seven years old, equivalent to a teenager in terms of its development, and it weighed about 330 kilograms when it died, about a tenth the weight of a fully grown adult. It's 330 kilograms is heavy, right? Like, I, I, I think in stones and pounds. I don't think I've mispronounced the name. Hang on, here we go. Uh, an array of earlier fossil evidence, including evident bite marks on the bones of larger, larger dinosaurs that match tyrannosaur teeth, have allowed scientists to build a picture of how the three-ton and adult gorgosaurs... Is it gorgosaurs? 700 plus pounds. You wouldn't want that sitting in your lap, would you? Oh, dear. You'd feel that in the morning. Boy, oh, boy. They've been described as, quote, quite indiscriminate eaters. I know the feeling, babe. Um, and that they <laughs> probably pronounced on large pay, prey, biting through bone and scraping off flesh. Quote, these smaller, immature tyrannosaurs are probably not ready to jump into a group of horned dinosaurs where adults weighed thousands of kilograms. Me neither. That sounds very scary. This fossil was originally discovered in the Alberta Badlands in 2009, which I know is a hotspot for dinosaur hunters too, because it was in, in Murdoch Mysteries. They go to the Alberta Badlands. Oh, he's laughing because I was talking about it being solid evidence. You'd want it to be solid evidence of that size. If it was gaseous, you'd be in problems, wouldn't you? The rock in the ribcage was removed to expose what was hidden inside. And lo and behold, the complete hind legs of two baby dinosaurs, both under a year old. <laughs> Dr. Zeletsniki said that finding only the legs suggested that this teenage Gorgosaurus, quote, seems to have wanted drumsticks Probably because that's the meatiest part. What is this, KFC? Is it finger-licking good? Probably not, because they've only got little arms. Uh, a Gorgosaurus is a slightly smaller, more ancient species than T-Rex. They were, when fully grown, quote, big, burly tyrannosaurs. We are told this specimen is unique, and it's physical proof that juveniles being very different in their feeding strategy. We have uh, Professor Steve Broussard, who is a paleontology paleontologist from the University of Edinburgh, said that seeing prey in the dinosaurs' guts gave a real insight into animals. Quote, they weren't just monsters. They were real living things and pretty sophisticated feeders. Well, I mean, it did eat babies. <laughs> It's pretty scary. I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to confront it myself. Talking about the film Jurassic Park, we are told a big adult T Rex wouldn't have chased after a car if cars or jeeps were around back then. Its body was too big and it couldn't move that fast. It would be the youngsters like this Gorgosaur, the children of T Rex, that you'd have to keep an eye on. What I love is that. Nerds are nerds, right? So when I sit down to watch a history movie, I'm like, well, here's where you're wrong. <laughs> Let me tell you all of these things. And equally, he is <laughs> he's still vexed about Jurassic Park. And I love that for him because I feel that. If, I might not feel this exactly the same way about Jurassic Park, but I feel that about history stuff sometimes. <laughs> um, a player saw 
a huge sea monster emerged from the Dorset cliffs. I wonder how far it would have been from where and when uh, where Mary Anning was doing her fossil hunting. This is the skull of this colossal sea monster has been extracted from the cliffs of Dorset's Jurassic Coast. It <laughs> Jamie's very upset that somebody's coming for Jurassic Park. He loves Jurassic Park. In fact, for his birthday, he got a Jurassic Park cake. Sorry, Jurassic World cake. He's very happy with it. My son picked it out. This is a pleosaur, a ferocious marine reptile that terrorised the oceans about 150 million years ago. This skull is a this skull fossil is two meters long. That is six foot five inches. So only a little bit taller than me. <laughs> if I was on stilts, um, it's one of the most complete specimens of its type ever discovered, and it's giving new insights into this ancient predator. And it's going to be far, par, going to be part of a TV program hosted by David Attenborough. Love David Attenborough. It's going to be on BBC One on New Year's Day. And so I think probably also then soon after on iPlayer. And if you are in a place where you don't have iPlayer, I would never under any circumstances suggest that you partake in a virtual private network, a, a virtual proxy network, a VPN. I would never suggest so much, ever, even though that might let you pretend to your internet that you're in the UK and thus able to watch BBC iPlayer. I would never suggest so much. We're told there were gasps as the sheet covering the fossil is pulled back and the skull is revealed for the first time. It's immediately obvious that, that this pleosaur is huge and beautifully preserved. It is massive. Absolutely massive. This fossil was found during a stroll along a beach near Kimmeridge Bay on the Jurassic Coast. Steve Etches and fellow fossil enthusiast Phil Jacobs came across the tip of the snout laying in the shingle. They then basically got a makeshift stretcher to take the fossil to safety. I. I actually have played Mary Anning for education groups at the Natural History Museum. I put on my own little Dorset accent and I did it like that. I did. I had a brilliant time in a frock. It was wonderful. So why not? I will, I will, uh, I will, I will have a, maybe for the new, in the new year, I will do a video on Mary Anning if people would like that. She is pretty cool. I like her a lot. <laughs> Um, also, she was so many of, we don't even know how many finds are actually hers because men, men would come in and buy her fossils and pass them off as their own. So it's very hard to know which are exactly hers and not, or, and which are not. The question is, where is the rest of the animal? There is a, a drone survey of the cliff face that's pinpointed a likely location. However, to get it out, you've got to abseil down from the top. <laughs> Thank you. Somebody braver than me can do that. This would be, <clears throat> would, would require somebody dangling from a rope 15 metres above a beach, uh, picking away at crumbling rock. I'm sure there are dedicated people. However, if they don't do it, there's a very real possibility that if there is any kind of coastal cliff erosion, we might lose all of the fossils. So there is a weighing up of how, how we go about this. Um, this newly discovered specimen has features that suggest that it had some particularly acute and useful senses. We're told that its snout is dotted with small pits that might have been the site of glands to help it detect changes in water pressure made by prospective prey. And on its head is a hole that would have housed a parietal or third eye. Lizards, frogs and some fish alive today have one of these. They do. What? They've got... I did not know that. It's light sensitive and it might have helped in locating other animals. 
especially when the player saw was surfacing from deep, murky waters. Did you know that these that some animals have a third eye? Did had no clue. The skull is going to go on display next year at his museum in Kimridge. It's called the Etches Collection. The, is the third eye news to anybody else? Because I feel like I had no idea that lizards, frogs, and some fish alive today have a third eye. I know about that weird fish that's got the light bulb sticking out of its face. I've heard that one that's in Finding Nemo. <laughs> um, but I did not. I hadn't. My husband's typing, so he might know. Uh, we're told it had vertebrae poking out the back of its head, but trailing off after just a few bones. So this is the thought process here. The rest of it's going to be in the cliff he, he says yes the amphibious chernobylus are you taking the mick out of chernobyl james i mean i know there's the three-eyed fish in the simpsons i know that he's he's cackling he's cackling he's a child <laughs> um he says, I'd stake my life, the rest of the animal is there. And really, it should come out in because it's in a very rapidly eroding environment. This part of the cliff line is going back by feet a year, and it won't be very long before the rest of the pleosaur drops out and gets lost. It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. It may well be, my love. And I, if you, do you know what? If you want to dangle there like a human yo-yo being buffeted by the wind... Godspeed and good luck. And I hope you get that dinosaur out, but it could not be me. It could not be me. A giant 200,000 year old stone hand axe has been discovered in the desert. This, so there are pictures of this. Um, with it with somebody holding it and it is it's a big boy um it is thought to be more than two hundred thousand years old this was found in northwestern saudi arabia we are told this hand axe is one of the most important finds from their ongoing survey of the survey of the area it is around half a meter or 20 inches long and it's the largest example of a series of stone tools that have been discovered on the site. Quote, an ongoing search for comparisons across the world has not yet come up with a hand axe of equal size. As such, this may well be one of the largest hand axes ever discovered. One wonders why you would want a larger hand axe. Is it the weight? A different substance? So this stone tool, 20 inches in length, 4 inches wide, 2 inches thick, is made of fine-grained basalt. Kieran, you're not the only one, because I, I looked at it too, six ways from Sunday, and I felt very similar. But I, I reliably am informed that, it's, that, it's, that it is not what it looks like. Um. So the in, in the evidence they've seen so far indicates that it had been worked on both sides to create a robust tool with usable cutting or chopping edges. I'm not saying that out loud, James. Um, at this stage, it's not clear exactly what the tool was used for. The researchers said this survey is still ongoing, and the artifact is one more is one of more than a dozen similar, albeit somewhat smaller, uh, Paleolithic hand axes that have been uncovered. <laughs> you can get your ritual purposes mugs on my website <laughs> you can also get your goth af t-shirts there as well um and your, your all of your reading the past needs coprolite is such a polite way to put it fossilized poopies a coprolite Yes, I, I'm guessing that, 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 that the weight of it must be what they're looking for. Um, but one would think, fairly unwieldy. Clearly, we will find out more.
Dorothy. That may well be what my husband just texted me about that hand axe. That's, re that's related. Also, that's not a me quote. That is a Jamila Jamil quote. Um, heroic work in the memes there. So we have archaeologists have found earliest evidence of mass weapon production in the southern Levant. What we have here, this has been published in the journal Atticot 111. They have found hundreds of identical sling stones. The study revealed that almost all of these sling stones were identical in size, an average length of 52 millimetres, a width of about 321 millimetres, and an average weight of 60 grams. This indicates, they say, that there was a mass production of weapons as far back as 7,200 years ago. These stones in, that were intended to be projected from a sling are smoothed with a specific biconical aerodynamic form, enabling exact and effective projection. Slimmer sling stones have been found at other sites in the country, uh, mainly at the Hula Valley and, and the Galilee in the north to the to the northern Sharon. But this is the first time they've been found in excavations in such large concentrations. We are told that these stones are in fact the earliest evidence of warfare in the southern Levant. The abundance of the sling stones and the considerable effort invested in their production suggest a deliberate readiness for conflict, potentially indicating a communal endeavour to create munitions. If so, it seems that in the early Chalakith Chalakith period, there was an escalation in preparations for warfare involving a change from individual to large-scale production. I mean, these are... They, I mean, that's so cool, isn't it? To have found all of that. Oh, I've done a jump. A closer look at the Menga Dolmen shows that it's one of the greatest engineering feats of the Neolithic, we are being told. Several people institute who are affiliated with several institutions in Spain have found that this site represents one of the greatest engineering feats in the Neolithic. They have put a study in scientific reports and... They use new technology to learn more about the stone that was used to create the ancient burial site and to explore how wooden rope would have been used in its construction. This site is in Malaga, Spain, and it dates to around 5,700 years ago. It is one of the largest known megalithic structures in Europe. It's built on top of a hill using large stones, the largest of which was more than 100 tonnes. The team is taking a closer look at the composition of these stones to, that were used to build the burial mound, where they came from and how they were transported. So they have used petrographic and stratigraph, stratigraphic analysis, analysis techniques, which shows the stones were mostly, mostly calcarinites a type of detrital sedimentary rock. I tell you what, say that sentence three times fast after having a glass of wine and you'll fall over. In the modern age, they are known as soft stones due to their fragility. According to researchers, such a type of rock would, ha would not would have been difficult to transport without causing damage, so it would have been hard to get it there. So this suggests there must have been a certain level of engineering sophistication. They because they moved and placed such low large stones at this site, so there's going to be massive planning and engineering. The capstone, according to researchers, weighs approximately 150 tons. They point out that placing such large rocks would have required the use of scaffolds, ropes, and also that transporting them would have required level roads. The burial ground was also built in such a way so it could point in a desired direction. Uh, 
because it's positionalized with nearby mountains in a way that creates complex light patterns inside the chamber. They also found that early engineers had devised a way to place stones at the edge of the burial chamber in an interlocking fashion to channel away water seepage as a means of preventing erosion. Right. In relation, where is this in relation to Stonehenge? Well, this is outside of um, Malaga in Spain. Now, my geography is shocking, but I'm going to say keep going south and then a bit, a bit west. Keep south and a bit west would be the, the location. Um, my understanding is that there are these types of monuments or complex monuments with stone being moved that exist at various parts of the world and they are roughly contemporaneous with each other. So, uh, yes. Interesting. We'll see what they what else comes out of this. A 3,500-year-old set of treasures have been found by mesh detectorists in Poland. The mesh detectorists are once again winning the day. So a forest in Poland. Ah, yes. So my husband just sent me a map of where it would be on the – that's on my phone. So, yeah, south and then a bit west. But not much west, pretty much directly, directly south almost from where Stonehenge would be. So a mesh detectorist wandering through a, a forest in Poland found five axes dating to the Bronze Age. They've been dated to approximately 3,500 years ago, and it's thought they were either used for chopping wood or for fighting, which, to be fair, tends to... <laughs> to be the predominant uses of axe. They're either for chopping wood or for chopping people. <laughs> That's what you do with them. Not what I do with them. I don't chop people. Um, <laughs> I feel the need to specify that. The uh, discovery is rare for the area. It's thought by experts that these axes were placed in the ground on purpose, likely as a trade or sacrifice related deposit. So it's thought these weapons could be related to Baltic culture. Similar discoveries have been made, but it has been nearly 20 years since a weapon or tool like the Axis has been discovered. The Starograd Forest District said that archaeologists also located an approximately 2,000-year-old fibula, which is similar to a brooch or pin that was likely used to fasten clothes. These artefacts were given as gifts and they were a testament to the owner's wealth. They've gone for they've you know they I feel like they've pinterested <laughs> they've pinterested their historical fight. They're like mm, the moss is good, but it's not Pinterest good. Let me just get this perfect leaf, <laughs> and I love it. I love it. We have another person to add to our incredible league of child archaeologists. A British teenager has discovered a rare Bronze Age hall. She's 13 and she's from Suffolk and her name is Millie. Good luck to you, Millie. You're a wonder. This is buried in a field in Hertfordshire, England, which is my husband refers to it. It's the county of opportunity. Uh, that's where he was born. She had a metro detector. If you, if you live anywhere near anything that might have been historical this Christmas, get your child a mesh detector because it will keep them busy and it also they might find treasure. The Her father thought she'd found an axe and in fact he was partially right. What she'd stumbled on was a trove of 65 Bronze Age axes and other artefacts that date to around 1300 BCE. 
Incredible. She said she was shocked that she almost fainted. She was like, Dad, I'm going to faint. Good on you, Millie. Um, you can see here this uh, magazine. This is Millie on the front of the searcher being celebrated for her find. She's apparently new to the hobby, beginner's luck, love that for her. Um, but she appears to have a natural ability for lo locating artifact. She's like a traveling pig, but for historical finds. Whenever I go out, I find stuff, she says. I found a gold plated button and an Elizabethan coin. It's nice just being in the field for hours. You get a signal, and it could be literally anything. And if this girl doesn't end up being an archaeologist, then her the way in which her inquiring mind has been fostered by this experience and by her parents supporting her think about wherever she takes wherever her life takes her think about that kind of diligence and inquiring mind and how well that's going to serve her and just what an incredible opportunity and, and a learning pattern for for a child um yes when my when my son can be trusted to not hit somebody around the head with the metal detector that will be he'll be getting one of those for christmas trust and believe so the find has been turned over to the local coroner's, coroner's office which will determine whether it's treasure or not and this cash will head to the british museum so that it can be uh, assessed in accordance with the treasure act the museum then may decide to purchase the artifacts once they have been assessed and valued if any money is offered for the hoard, the young master treacherist does plan to split the proceeds with the field's owner. She said, we're going to try and find gold. You little pirate, I love it. That's the one thing we're aiming for. And when we do, we're going to do a little dance. Amazing. <laughs> we do try and give him a lot of fun. We went on... Saturday, we took him over to Hampton Court Palace. He loves the palace. He doesn't really get the historical significance. He he mostly thinks he's going to find Elsa, but he's having a lovely time. Uh, and he did love running around the gardens at Hampton Court. And it was the festive fair as well. So um, he got to, they had big, square, like chonky marshmallows. And they they had a fire pit that you could cook them in. So he got to have his first toasted marshmallow and i think he was very confused by this by the sugar <laughs> very confused by the sugar and then later he saw cookies so he had those as well um so it was a it was a day where he was absolutely pepped up on sugar and then in the car on the way home he had a danger nap which made made that night sleep super fun <laughs> oh, what a time to be alive so yes well done millie excellent work Museum is raising money to keep some very rare treasure. This is a hoard of 50 Bronze Age artifacts. Supporters a danger nap is when you know there is an, a cutoff point where your child can safely nap and then wake up and go to bed at a reasonable time. If they have a danger nap, they will they will never sleep. <laughs> Not, not. It won't be that they'll sleep an hour later. No, 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 no. They will be climbing the walls like something out of train spotting <laughs> for the next sixteen hours. Yep, you don't sleep that night. They don't sleep that night. <laughs> I also take danger naps all the time. However, when I am awake in the middle of the night because I've danger napped in the afternoon, I am not trying to be a face hugger to um, the people in the house with me. I, I have a, a modicum of decorum. Not much, but some. Supporters of a museum are hoping to raise £4,200, which actually, in terms of like museum money, isn't really a lot, to keep a hoard of Bronze Age treasure in Corredigan. So these are 50 artefacts from about 3,000 years ago found by metal detectorists in a field near Langathelio in 2020. These are tools, body ornaments, and they were declared to be treasured by a coroner. 
Aberystwyth Museum can buy the artefacts, so its supporters are trying to raise the money needed to keep them in the county. We're told it's a very rare find. It's got hammers, spearheads, body jewellery. It's a comprehensive collection, and it goes to prove just how advanced people were at the time. Um, these sorts of Bronze Age finds are not to a penny. There's a, quite a few of them around the United Kingdom, but in that area, it's the very first world provenance toward of its kind. So it's a really significant find for Keredigan. Uh, Mr. Evans has started an online fundraiser. If I can find that and locate the fundraiser, I will share it in the comments section. If anybody else can find it, please do pop it either in the comments um, or send me over an email and I'll add it to the description box. Yes, yeah, Steve, it's it's a it's a it's a fascinating article. I'll be honest, I'm I don't know how long it would take me to get to this part of Wales, but what an incredible find. And actually I understand if it can't go to this museum, it's going to Aberystwyth. But having a find like this for for a smaller local museum is a really incredible thing because it, it will draw people. And tourism is great for local economies it's great for museums and it's also it reminds the local people and their children that these things are found it drives people towards perhaps studying history this is disturbing um so archaeologists have unearthed an ancient bakery prison in Pompeii. It is, quote, the most shocking side of ancient slavery. We are told that enslaved people were exploited to grind grains and make bread in the cramped bakery with iron barred windows and no exit to the outside world. The bakery was found in a home as part of a larger project in the Reggio 9 area of the Pompeii Archaeological Park. It reveals more evidence of the daily life of Pompeii's enslaved people who were often sidelined in history lessons of the ancient city. They found indentations in the floor, which points to there being animals who were forced to walk around blindfolded for hours. The director, Gabriel Zutrigel, has said, it is a space in which we have to imagine the presence of people of servile status. It is the most shocking side of ancient slavery, the one devoid of both trusting relationships and promises of manumission, where we were reduced to brute violence, an impression that is entirely confirmed by the securing of the few windows with iron bars. The home was believed to have been undergoing renovations when Vesuvius erupted, destroying Pompeii as it was submerged into volcanic ash. <laughs> Thousands of Romans had no idea they were living beneath, who had no idea they were living beneath one of the biggest volcanoes were killed. A, we are told an, exhibi an exhibition dedicated to the enslaved people of Pompeii will begin at the Archaeological Park on the 15th of December. On the, um, on the blindfolded question... I am assuming because uh, my understanding is they are they aren't talking about the enslaved people being blindfolded. They are talking about the beasts of burden being blindfolded. I believe they talked about donkeys. I don't know how they know that. My assumption is that that is something that one needs to do to kind of cover the eyes of an animal to get it to move in that circular pattern. I'm not sure if anybody does know why they would need to blindfold donkeys to get them to do this kind of work, um, I would appreciate the knowledge. And in terms of how they know, when I read it, my assumption was that that's just what they do with donkeys today. So they realised they had to have done it then. Um, the flip side is, have they seen it? Is there some kind of painting or image that uh, shows what's going on and, and how they are using these animals. I hope your four-legged animals 
your four-legged furry son has a wonderful vet examination and behaves himself. Equines are is is so because I, I obviously you sort of see with like they have the blinkers on for shire horses and stuff. Um, so uh, so perhaps this is then an assumption that is being made based upon how we deal with these kinds of animals today. Perhaps perhaps that's what's going on there. You certainly don't want a rearing animal in a tight in a cramped space. That's no thanks. I wouldn't want to be booted by one of those hooves with a cross donkey or pit pony. But I think there's a, as I've said before, this is not my period of history, but I think there is, there is a kind of truth, university acknowledged that isn't really a truth, that we hear stories of the lives of former slaves. For example, we've talked previously about that incredible um, house that has been reopened to the public with all of the wall paintings, and it's thought that it was two formerly enslaved people who were given their liberty, who bought the liberty, who then went on to have incredible success in the Roman Empire. And I think that those are the stories that we hear all too often. And it's really important to remember that these stories are also stories that exist. Archaeologists have found large Roman baths beneath a city's museum in Croatia. This is restoration work in the Split City Museum. Croatia is beautiful and Split is beautiful too. This is one of the most important and visited museums in Croatia. Large Roman baths and mosaics were found under the building during the reconstruction of the ground floor. The city of Split has a history spanning more than 2,000 years. Lots of that area of Croatia was used uh, as part of the filming of Game of Thrones. I think it was used, I think it might have been Dawn was filmed there. Some of Dawn was filmed there and possibly also some of King's Landing, maybe. These works are part of a project called Palace of Life, City of Change. and They've unearthed a valuable archaeological site boasting hitherto unseen ancient remains from the time of the construction of Diocletian's palace. It's, it's incredibly, I went there for my, for my friend's wedding and it's, Croatia is one of the most beautiful places. Incredible place. Some parts of it are really difficult to get to. Havar is really difficult to get to, but it's incredibly beautiful. I mean, if you're going to find one, it, it's 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 ideal. You've got the team to sort of deal with it, haven't you? In the former museum reception, the structure of the ancient floor, underfloor heating and opening for warm air connected to the stove, a praetorium, an opening inside the underfloor heating and a furnace construction have all been discovered. They then did a deeper dig that found an ancient mosaic in a, in the southern room, followed by a continuation of the ancient wall in the central room, um, complete with a pool and an oil and grape press. A pool with a white mosaic floor was found in the northern room next to the staircase. And we have been told that these discoveries are related to water because they are pools and cisterns so the thought process is that this was these were once thermal baths in the northern part, northern part of Diocletian's palace the plan is to have the excavated rooms open to the public however before visitors can come in they do need to reinforce the walls and secure the structures so architects are going to design a system of walkways above the open archaeology to uh, allow movement across the site. I'm everyone keep your eyes peeled for when this opens because or when it's slated to open because I'm going to see if I can email them for an invite. <laughs> Just you know a little little sojourn over to uh, Croatia, a little cheeky trip to go to a museum launch. They probably won't invite me, but I could ask. <laughs> don't ask, you don't get right.
King's Landing's filmed in Dubrovnik. I swear something is filmed in Croatia because they did like a Game of Thrones tour. But I can't remember which bit. Two statuettes of Demeter. Is it Demeter or Demeter? I say Demeter, but I think it could be Demeter. Um, have been discovered in Western Turkey. This is the Greek goddess of earth and fertility, was found in a cistern in the ancient city in Western Turkey. This location was also an important sanctuary of Apollo. The excavation team um, led by the Professor Yusuf Sezgin is actively working in this space. The system was found in, near the road to the sanctuary of Athena in the city and they said that they have made you've heard it as Demeter Demeter Demeter, Demeter Demeter, I don't even know her <laughs> Demeter, I don't even know her that's fun <laughs> so it could be Demeter hmm well, we've got some The system we excavated this year is quite different from others in both its form and artefacts found within. Yes, it's a lot. There are a lot of those. I think I've already told this story. When I first started dating my husband, um, he, as I, I've told, said before, he was his secondary education happened in France, and we were talking about something or other. And what was it? He said he said something. He referred to Don Quixote, and I was like, who's, what, who's Don Quixote? And then I realised that he, he meant Don Quixote, and I thought, well, it's a good job he's pretty, because he doesn't know how to pronounce Don Quixote. And then I realised that actually it's because he is, he speaks many languages, and I only speak one. So while I was feeling all proud of myself and puffed up, I very swiftly went um, and realised that I was the one. Eh, eh. <laughs> wrong okay that's it right i knew i knew they had um because they did game of thrones tours and they were making they were making money off of going to the to the locations right so it's the location for marine where the unsullied come from there we go Thank you very much. That was going to drive me wild if I hadn't uh, figured that one out. Thank you for pointing me in the right direction. We're told the system excavated this year is quite different from others in both its form and artefacts found within. For example, we discovered a figurine specially placed under what we call the cistern bracelet, a recess at the entrance of the cistern. Normally, we don't find such figures inside cisterns. This one, specifically placed or laid there, depicts the goddess Demeter, possibly Demeter, as we know from Greek mythology. We are told the system's proximity to the sacred area suggests it may be associated with, associated with Demeter Demeter festivals. This system is unique in that more figurines were discovered inside than any other system. Mesh detectorists have found a very rare ancient gold coin in Norway, over 1,600 miles away from its origin. A very rare ancient gold coin has been found in the mountains of central Norway, and it could be a lost money that once belonged to an early monarch, according to Norwegian officials. We're told that this coin has held up exceptionally well, which certainly you can see. It looks like it was largely unchanged when it was lost, perhaps a thousand years ago. This ancient coin was introduced by the Byzantine or Byzantine Empire, also called the Eastern Roman Empire. 
it's thought that it was minted in Constantinople, which is modern day Istanbul. It's decorated on both faces, with one side appearing to show an embossed illustration of Christ holding a Bible. The other side appears to depict former Byzantine Byzantine emperors Basil II and Constantine VIII. The two brothers were named co-rulers of the Byzantine Empire towards the end of the 9th century. The coin has got written inscriptions too, one saying Jesus Christ, King of those who reign, and the other saying Basil and Constantine, emperors of the Romans. And there is something to me it's so amusing that somebody's that he is called Basil because I always think of um I always think of Basil Brush, which may be a peculiarly UK reference to a kid's puppet. So whenever I think Buzz Basil, I think Basil Brush. At the height of its power, this empire comprised much of the land surrounding the Mediterranean Sea, so uh, parts of Italy, Greece and Turkey, as well as portions of North Africa and the Middle East. It's thought that actually one of these, this coin may once have belonged to Harald Hadrada, a Norwegian king who ruled from 1046 to 1066. He was killed when he invaded England and tried to take the English throne after the death of Edward the Confessor from Harold Godwinson. Godwinson saw him off um, and then came had to come back down and fight William, Duke of Normandy, who later became known as William the Conqueror. So many battles. Battle 40, Battle of Baker Street. I, I mean, I just went straight to Basil Brush. Basil! 40 Towers. <laughs> So the metal detectors found this coin late in the fall season. So the spot where it was found is not going to be discovered until um, next year. We're told this is not the first time that a metal detector so-called struck go gold while probing the land in Norway. A Norwegian man in the summer found nine pendants, three rings and ten gold, gold pearls with a metal detector, metal detector. And then also in October, the Museum of Cultural History in Oslo announced that dozens of ancient gold foil figurines depicting images of Norse gods were found at the site of a pagan temple um, near a farm in Vingrom, which is 100 miles south of the capital city. A trove, which is an odd way to refer to human remains, but nevertheless, a trove of 900-year-old mummies have been unearthed in Peru. In, if Just as a warning, when you click on this, there, there are pictures, close-up pictures of these human remains, which obviously, as we know, I don't share, but um, they are there. So if you click on it, you will see those. We are told that more than 900 years ago, 22 people were wrapped in fabric and buried in Peru. Now their mummies have been discovered, as as well as the treasures they took with them to their grave. At the site, the experts found these 22 intact burials, six adults and 16 children under the age of two. Um, Lukas Marques is an archaeologist who's involved in the project. We are told the mummies were wrapped in fabric and plant material. Between the layers of fabric were artefacts, including pottery, ceramics and tools. These burials date to between 1,000 and 1,100. We're told that high child mortality was not unusual in ancient times, so the abundance of child burials is not necessarily surprising. But there is clear differences in burial style between adult and child mummies, which did stand out to experts. The burials happened at similar depths in the ground, but adult bodies were in a vertical fetal position with their limbs tucked into their chests, while the child bodies were arranged horizontally. The children were also buried away from the adults. They have, have started to examine the bundles and they have noticed and decided that these bodies were intentionally mummified. 
experts have said that the burial bundles were meant to be useful to the dead in the afterlife. And in some bundles, they found corn cobs and other plant materials. This location is about 120 miles north of Lima in Peru. We have got another extraordinary child to add to our league of child archaeologists, a 12-year-old who has noticed a metal object in a dirt driveway and found a medieval weapon. This is a dry... Well, when, after what construction work on a driveway in Poland finished, a 12-year-old boy noticed something metallic in the dirt. He thought it looked historic, and it was. They had brought extra dirt over from the nearby town of Klodnica and added it to the driveway. Then he found this item and his parents then reported the find to archaeological authorities who have identified it as a mace head from the 12th, 12th to 14th century. Uh, um, for those of you who don't know, a mace is a, the, a big smashy stick. <laughs> bam, bam. Um, these mace heads came in a variety of shapes. This is clearly got some spikes added and it's about 600 years old. These they're now blunted, but they would have been spikes in ver in various different directions. They don't know if the damage was caused by fighting or by the mace being used as a tool. Um, this find is going to go to a local museum. So Vitold, the twelve-year-old boy who found this, congratulations uh, and welcome to the league. The League of Child, Arche Child Archaeologists. Stories of ordinary medieval folk have been revealed in a Cambridge bone study. They have been telling the stories of ordinary folk before and after the Black Death. They've been looking at them in medieval cemeteries. <laughs> Knights of old did love to go clubbing. Big smashy smash. <laughs> Do it. The big smashy stick. <laughs> That's the way to get your opponents to underestimate you. That's it. Sneak attack with a deadly smashy weapon. <laughs> so they have been, archaeologists have been investigating um, diets, DNA and bodily traumas. And they've been doing this in the townsfolk, scholars and friars of Cambridge. They've looked at about 500 medieval skeletal remains. Professor John Robb has said, quote, like all medieval towns, Cambridge was a sea of needs. Dr. Sarah Inskip has said, quote, the importance of using osteobiography on ordinary folk rather than elites who are documented in historical sources is that they represent the majority of the population, but are those that we know least about. To make the samples relatable, she said, the project do, drew on names found in medieval records to give pseudonyms to the people studied. What was a man who survived the plague, dying with cancer at the city's charitable hospital, while Anne lived a life beset with injuries, leaving her to hobble with a shortened right leg? Meanwhile, Edmund suffered from leprosy, yet was not separated from the wider society instead living with ordinary people to end up buried in a rare wooden coffin. Almost all the townsmen had asymmetric arm bones, with their right upper arm bone built more strongly than their left one, reflecting tough working regimes, particularly in early adulthood. About 10 men from the hospital burial, burial ground had symmetrical upper arm bones. No signs of poor upbringing, limited growth or chronic illness. It's clear they say that these men did not habitually do manual labour or craft. They lived in good health with decent nutrition, normally to an older age. And it's likely, therefore, they were the scholars of the university. While they did not have the novice to grave support of clergy and religious orders, they were mostly supported by family money. University has not changed since the medieval period. Um, patronage or earnings from teaching. As the university grew, more scholars would have ended up in hospital cemeteries. Medieval Cambridge was home to just a few thousand people, but by 1400, that included between four to 700 scholars. 
that was my first thought. I do. They in the I think it was the Mary Rose. They found that actually the repeated drawing of very he heavily weighted long bones, long bows, beginning before you had gone through your full adolescence, actually resulted in a deformation of that structure of the arm because things don't fuse properly. That was where my brain went, but that's they are making that connection. Um, my brain went straight to uh, longbow too. <clears throat> the plague came to Cambridge between 1348 to 9, and it did kill about 60% of the population. The osteobiographies are, have used all available evidence to reconstruct a person's life, and you can check out what they found on a new website launched by the After the Plague Project. Now, this next article, I've seen people getting spicy about it, but I don't know if they're just getting spicy because there's reference to there being black people in medieval London. Um, I don't know. So I haven't had a chance to look at, because I, I sort of just saw a headline and then I, I was moving on with my day. Um, so I don't know why people are reacting to this, but I have seen some negative responses. However. This is the result of a study and it's being shared here. In the result, of, in this study, we are informed that um, black women of African descent were the most likely to, to die during an outbreak of bubonic plague between 1348 and 1350. Um, this is research from the Museum of London who wanted to understand the potential role played by racism in black death fatalities and to also dismantle the image of a white medieval England. So they used 145 sets of human remains that have been found in three UK cemeteries, which had been designed for plague victims. They then examined the victim's bones and teeth to make sense of the racial makeup of the deceased. Out of the 145, they found that 49 had died of plague, nine of whom were of African descent, around 18%. The 96 who died of other causes included eight people of African descent, around 8%. The researchers said the high proportion of African people who had died of plague versus other causes could be representative. The researchers found that more people of colour and black women in particular were buried in cemeteries for people who died of the plague than those who were not black. I think it's it's important to reference that, to my knowledge, uh, um, dying of plague does not leave marks on the bones. So presumably we are saying plague pit, death of plague. And that may well be the case, but also plague pit fast, cheap burial is correlation or is causation. I, I, don't, I don't know. I just want to flag that because to my knowledge, there is no mark on the bone that leaves, that points out someone's side of plague. Um, I don't believe we do know the percentage of non-white non people or non-Europeans in England at that time. I, I, I'm not sure how we could, because we certainly haven't excavated. We could perhaps, if we did a full scale excavation of everything uh, and date it, we could figure out how many people died here and were buried here. But that doesn't mean that they were the only people who lived here. Not sure. <clears throat> What we are told, though, is that Chaucer's 14th century medieval London was a black London. This is study author Dorothy Kim, who is a professor at Brandeis University in the States. We're told death of plague was largely relegated to the least privileged in society. The authors wrote their study paper, said that their results are an indication of the devastating effects of pre-modern structural racism. 
we are told that the Black Death is widely considered to be one, if not the most devastating public health dis disasters in history. About 50 million people died of the plague, around 60% of Europe's population. There has been work stated that actually it was that there are locations where people fared better. Um, and there are spots where farming records seem to point that they were relatively untouched by it. And I'm not sure they figured out why that had happened. People didn't know at the time how plague was spread. The authors in the study have ri written that their work highlights, quote, how a substantial community can be erased from history. Although previous research had noted the multiracial character of British society in medieval times, the period is awfully, often falsely considered to have been purely white, they said, referring to a quite white nostalgia. This white nostalgia is rooted in the same white supremacist ideology that has fed contemporary violence. Likewise, they wrote, medieval study scholarship has boosted this pre-racial version of the pre-modern past that has allowed medieval cultures, societies and writers and power brokers to hide behind white innocence when the truth is that race, structural racism, was invented, refined and rehearsed in medieval England. And I think that's very interesting. I think particularly something that I've definitely heard uttered and stated, the notion that the Black Death was a universal uh, killer, a, um, a great leveller, if you will, that it affected poor and rich and was essentially equal a blanket across all of the continent has been discredited in a few ways for a start the the farming evidence seems to point to there being some parts on the continent that were relatively unscathed um but also this this idea that it's the great leveler there is a, a great and body of evidence we're told, including this latest study that questions the assumption that it was a universal killer. And that actually, rather than that, there is evidence pointed towards it being something that has far greater effects on communities where privation and poverty are also endemic. What this says to me is that we have, we're scratching the surface of our plague knowledge and research, and there is much more to find out. I mean, you would think, however, the the feudal over, overlords left behind weren't keen on that. And so that's when laws started coming in about people not being able to withdraw their labour, people not being able to move on and people not being able to fight for higher wages. So. Uh, yeah, there, there, there is. Um, the, the lice that came on rats were bringers of plague that essentially um, bubonic plague was spread through flea bites. Of course, the other thing is that bubonic plague can become pneumonic plague and pneumonic plague can then be aerosolized and people can have both bubonic and pneumonic plague, but pneumonic plague doesn't always show up with buboes to my understanding. So, Yes, we still have lots to learn. Nearly 8,000 medieval coins and seven Bronze Age swords have been unearthed in Germany. This is a bounty of centuries-old artefacts, including seven swords, thousands of silver coins, jewellery and pottery have been found by a group of volunteer conservationists. The excavators discovered the items last year at three separate locations in the German countryside. Officials from Germany's State Office for Culture and Monument Preservation presented their findings on November the 22nd. They talk about how volunteers are indispensable for preserving their cultural heritage. And they've got to thank volunteer conservationists for three outstanding finds. So some artefacts were broken apart and they have managed to piece them back together. So a little. There have been lots of coin stories today. 
haven't they? Must be must be something in the in the soil, so to speak. Um, so yeah, really fascinating. What what a great load of finds. And uh, as more information on that about that, I will let you know. Look at these. Two rare painting by the Sienese master Pietro Lorenzetti have come to light after we're told a century in obscurity. These are fabulous pieces. These are apparently the last two known paintings by the 40, early 14th century master. He has a corpus of only about 30 works. And these two paintings are going to come to auction in December in Paris. And it's thought they might sell for as much as $2.8 million for the pair. Or if they get split up across the pair. This is the latest discovery of the art historian detective Eric Turquin. He is the head of the Paris firm Cabinet Turquin. He's come upstairs. I heard him. Um, three other major early Quattro Centro works have sold for multi million dollar prices in France after this particular person found them. The Le Derision de Christ, which the Louvre acquired this month, sold for about $26.5 million. They've got the Metropolitan Museum of Arts Virgin and Child Enthroned that sold for $6.8 million. And then a small panel by Bernardo Dardi for $1.4 million. These rediscovered panel paintings are fragments from a larger altar piece, altar piece, sorry. They depict St. Sylvester and St. Helena. They come from the descendants of the 19th century collector, Alfred Rame. They read about Turkin's discovery and they emailed him photos of the paintings, believing they may have some value. Turns out they were right. We're told, quote, this is why Lorenzetti is so important. He was painting roughly 100 years after the death of St. Francis, who brought human feelings into religion. Painters like Simui and Lorenzetti introduced us into paintings. He transformed icons, stiff and majestic, full of symbolic power, into real paintings that move you. And this is why they are worth so much. They are the origin of Western painting. I can definitely see that. I can, they they have a very. I can definitely see where you're coming from there. They are absolutely beautiful, though, aren't they? Fabulous pieces. As indeed, so much orthodox art is just the opulence of the gold. More art discoveries. We've got a one hundred million dollars. I feel like Doctor Evil. Million dollars. Uh, Botticelli found in a family home in Italy has unsurprisingly spurred a investigation into who its rightful owner might be. This has been found hidden or forgotten for 50 years, and it's been found in a family home just outside of Italy, in Naples in Italy. The artwork was apparently originally displayed in a small church in Italy before being given to a local family who safe-kept it in their private residence for several generations. They safe-kept it so well. <laughs> Actually, it looks suspiciously like they were hiding it. <laughs> um, the painting, one of the last works of Botticelli, valued at around 100 million euros, which is roughly the same as it is in dollars, disappeared under mysterious cirques. And then there was a few fruitless search by Italian states, and it was considered to be lost. This painting is dated the 15th century, depicts the virgin and child, in, though in a state of distress. The canvas is abraded. There's chromatic deterioration due to the oxidization of the varnish. It basically needs an extensive restoration before it can go on public display. We're told the artwork had been passed down from generation to generation among members of this family. But we are acquiring, uh, evaluating whether they acquired it properly. If we were to verify that the family who owned it was not entitled to keep it, then it will pass into the hands of the state. Another tea. Thank you, Poppet. Um, 
otherwise it could remain the property of the family but exhibited in a museum to ensure greater security. We are told that Pope Sixtus the Fourth, Pope Sixtus the Fourth, donated this piece to a small countryside church as a tribute to obtain economic support from the powerful Medici family to finance the completion of the Sistine Chapel. Continuing on, quote, many of us fought for this painting to be returned to the community when its traces were lost. They said it ended up in a safety deposit box. Now we hope it can find its rightful place in a museum. Jamie's always taking tea requests. Lovely, lovely little, lovely little tea boy. He's actually also, he is in the, he has been, for the last few months, bless him, he has been working on something that I think you are going to love as a resource. And when it's finished, he's going to come on the channel and explain how it works. And uh, we will then show it off. Think it's going to be he's been working it for ages it's going to be super cool they have found one of my favorite named places i think collie western is a really delicious word it feels tasty this is collie western palace home of henry the seventh's mother we know who she is that's margaret beaufort has been uncovered despite quote no money no expertise no plans babe it's my life um a group of amateur archaeologists set out to find the buried remains of this Tudor palace in uh, the Northamptonshire village five years ago. Dr. Cat's Ding Dong database. One day, I'm going to make a T-shirt. Um, many of us were brought up in the village and you hear about this lost palace and you wonder if it's a myth or real. So we wanted to find it. They said, we're a bunch of amateurs. We had no money, no expertise, no plans, no artist impressions to go off and nothing remaining of the palace. It's naivety and just hard work that's led us to it. Um, there have been lots of attempts to find Collie Weston. But without the advantages of modern technology, none has so far succeeded. This palace was famous during the 15th century. Uh, there was a number of historic events that took place there. There were wedding celebrations of Margaret Tudor um, for her marriage to James IV of Scotland. It's also a place where Henry VIII is recorded as holding court on, oh, my son's woken up, on the 16th and 17th of October, 1541. It fell into disrepair in the mid-17th century, but now the walls have been found in March. Historians from the University of York have helped to verify this group's findings and to identify the palace, though some have through some uncovered stone mouldings. And they're going to work with chaps on more excavations to further reveal the structure and, con and um, conserve it for the future. Seems like no ground penetrating radar. Um, yes, but they still managed to find it. His dad's going to put him back to bed. This team has got more than 80 members, ranging from teenagers to people in their 70s and 80s. They set up their plan to find the palace in 2018, using local folk tales and hearsay to refine the search area. They so no ground penetrating radar, however, they no hang on a second, they said there was no technology, but there is. They carried out geophysical surveys and used ground penetrating radar to reveal the location of palace walls before securing permission from homeowners to excavate the gardens. So when they said no money, no expertise, no plans, no artist impressions to go off, they did have like quite a lot of tech, but they said they'd done it all on an absolute shoestring. We've basically done it done an eighty to ninety thousand pounds thousand pound project for roughly thirty thirteen thousand pounds. For us being a little society to achieve this with no money, expertise, or plans, I think it's something the whole society should be um proud of. 
I absolutely agree. Fabulous. Um, no, I have nothing to do with the Missing Princess project. Nothing. A portrait of a Spanish queen is apparently expected to smash the Velasquez auction record. This is a portrait of Isabel de Bourbon, the, the Queen of Spain, which has been valued in the region of $35 million. This is a full-length portrait of a Spanish queen by Diego Velázquez, and it's expected to smash the existing record for a work by this 17th century artist when it's auctioned early next year. This is a two-metre high canvas, and it shows Isabel in her early 20s. She's in a highly decorated and elaborate court dress, holding a fan in one hand with her other resting on the back of a chair. And she has got a lovely ruff, hasn't she? Do love a bit of ruff. Um, <laughs> King Philip IV of Spain and Portugal had appointed Velázquez as the court painter, and a large portion of his work consisted of royal portraits of the king, his family, their court jesters and dwarves. This portrait hung for many years in Madrid. It then went to France. And then in the 19th century, it was sold to Harry Huth, or Harry Huth, a merchant banker and book collector who hung it in Sussex. Uh, we are told royal portraiture allowed Velasquez to push forward art in new and revolutionary ways. And this grand portrayal of Isabel de Bourbon is an exceptional example of the artist at the height of his powers shaping the direction of portraiture for generations to follow. No other Velasquez paintings of this scale and importance have come to the market in more than half a century. So when we know what it goes for, I will, of course, let you all know. Last but by no means least in the new news, we have this bad boy. A 170-year-old champagne has been recovered and tasted from a Baltic shipwreck. I don't drink alcohol, but I think even when I did, I'm not sure that this would have appealed to me to, to have a sippy sip of this. However, we are told that this, and this has been, um, this cache of bottles has been claimed by the local government of, of Finland. The article seems to point to it not being vinegar. A small sample of the preserved beverage was tested and tasted, and it has been published in the Proceedings of National of the National Academy of Sciences. Now, what they have said is, by a stroke of luck, the bottles have been preserved in the ideal conditions at a depth characterised by minimal light and temperatures ranging between 35 and 39 degrees Fahrenheit. The researchers observed very low levels of acetic acid in the wine, a primary red flag for spoilage. So as part of the testing, the panel had a, the team had a panel of wine experts take a taste. The compiled responses were then compared to the chemical findings. Now, something that's supposedly not spoiled the experts described the Baltic wines with words such as animal notes, wet hair, and cheesy. So basically, it tastes like you're smelling a barnyard. <laughs> but apparently, after the wine was swelled a bit in the glass, providing some much-needed oxygen, it took on a whole new character. Once it had a chance to breathe, the champagne was described as grilled, spicy, smoky, and leathery. Which again does not appeal as a drink, but okay. Um, 
a John Day uh, was able to obtain a hundred microliters to try. Said it was incredible. I've never tasted such a wine in my life. But it's a, <laughs> it's like the inside of a satchel. So. <laughs> Do not. Um, the aroma stayed in my mouth for three or four hours after tasting it. Rather you than me, babe. Um, apparently other bottles have been sent to museums or historical institutions. And further work might prove useful to enologists who are now investigating the potential for deep sea ageing as a technique to enhance or augment the taste of various wines. I'll stick to tea, but you know, whatever floats your boat, or in this case, sinks it with champagne on board. As for does it come from the champagne region of France or is it just sparkling shipwreck juice? I they're calling it champagne. They are not calling it champagne capital C though in the article. Does that it still has to be champagne, right? Otherwise, it's just sparkling spoilage. <laughs> Friends, we're moving on to the ding dongs. It's time. There's my little my little piddling boy bell. It it's happening. Uh, a Jerusalem court has acquitted a man who smashed quote blasphemous statues at the Israel Museum. So in some ways, this is an update, but it was an update to the Ding Dong News. Stephen Edward Porth, a 40-year-old American tourist from California, has been accused of smashing the valuable historical statues. He has His, his defence is that he suffers from something called Jerusalem Syndrome, and, it, and his attorney admitted on his behalf that he committed acts attributed to him. A psychiatric opinion received in his case found him competent to stand trial, but at the same time determined that at the time of the incident, he was not responsible for his actions. The president of the Jerusalem Magistrates Court, Judge Shmuel Herbst, who acquitted him, sent him to involuntary hospitalisation for four years, a period equal to the maximum prison sentence for the offence attributed to him. The So uh, his, his acquittal, I think, is based upon the fact that while competent to stand trial, at the time he committed the offence, he was incompetent by reason of mental disease or defect or whatever the equivalent statute is that would affect the, the magistrate's court in Jerusalem. Them. I mean, I don't believe in, in most magistrates' courts, certainly not in this country, a magistrate couldn't sentence you to be committed. So I, I don't know necessarily, but I'm assuming that the acquittal is, because obviously he has been incarcerated, so the acquittal is based upon, by defect or disease, he's uh, unfit or was unfit at the time. So the actions were recorded on security camera. He caused about a million dollars worth of damage. The police said that he acted with cunning and with premeditation. He waited until closing time so there was no crowd. According to investigators, he had intended to break more sculptures, but when his actions created a noise, he stopped. Fourth said he did not regret smashing the sculptures. Bold. Um, and he'd wanted to do so on previous visits to Israel and other museums. He, when interrogated, he confessed. He claimed that these statues contradicted his faith and religion. He said they were statues of idolatry, contrary to the laws of the Torah. He then, according to the indictment, he tried to flee the museum, but he was detained uh, by security guards and then police officers arrested him. He has been incarcerated since. He has failed to raise the amount required for bail. The Israel Museum said that the management sees this as a worrisome and exceptional case. They condemn violence of any kind and hope that such incidents will not be repeated. We are told this is a shocking case of destruction of cultural values. We see with concern the fact that cultural values are just being destroyed by religiously motivated extremists. We will speak with the management of the Israel Museum to ensure that such incidents do not reoccur. I... I'm, I'm, it's odd that 
he has been determined to be fit to plead and to stand trial. However, was deemed to be incompetent at the time of the offence and thus acquitted. However, is going to still be held for a period of four years on a mental health hold in a mental health facility. It's very strange that those things can all be the case. Also, his completely, seemingly unapologetic nature. Um, we included this in Ding Dong because it was in the Ding Dong in the first place. But I also saw an article about a lady who tried to fire to Martin Luther King's Martin Luther King Jr.'s house. Uh, and there is still more. I'm, I held off on putting this in here because there's still, I think, more reporting to be done on that. But I think what we're seeing in both cases are two individuals who are clearly struggling with their mental health. And while that doesn't exonerate or absolve them of this, it's, it is different, I think, to somebody who, while drunk, pulls a thumb off of a terracotta warrior or for the perfect selfie, climbs up on a priceless antique carved statue and creates damage so i i don't i don't know yeah i just i don't think he's very well and that's and it must be pretty scary to be inside his head i think um and i hope that in the next four years he gets the help that he needs we're now moving on to events and exhibitions the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston have got new items in their Albert and Ethel Herstein Gallery for Judaica. This is a permanent gallery now. This is a, a and it offers a permanent presence for art made for Jewish communities around the world to fulfil the practice of their faith. They have got more than two dozen objects in the inaugural installation of this new gallery and it has been endowed by the Albert and Ethel Herstein Charitable Foundation. So this is open. It opened on December the 3rd, and it's now a permanent exhibition. If you get a chance to check it out, do let me see. What, do let me know what you think. Let us all know what you think. The This Torah crown, absolutely beautiful. Um, so I I look forward to seeing what you think of it. The Met Museum has got a Manet Degas slash Degas exhibition. That's going, you, you've got just under a month left to check that out. So maybe if you're not going to the Panto, the US doesn't do Pantos, does it? Panto is, I mean, Panto is great. <laughs> so it's, a, it's so fun. Um, they've got an exhibition going through to the 7th of January, 2024 at the Met Fifth Avenue. So that looks fabulous as well. And I should, rem I should remember, on both the Opera Pin board that is linked and also in the description box, you will see that when you get to the exhibitions, you will find that there is a sort of number and then a letter A. That is for the accessibility information. So if you do have access needs, I have left a link to the accessibility information for each of these institutions slash exhibitions. Um, sometimes it's just a number that you have to call, unfortunately. But in most of these cases, there is quite detailed accessibility information should that be something that you require. In the UK, part of the University of Nottingham, Lakeside Arts, this looks fabulous. This is also running just to Sunday, the 7th of January. It's called Reimagining the Victorians. As you can see, they do have some interesting gallery times. They are closed on Mondays. They are open Tuesday to Saturday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. and Sunday from 12 noon to 4 p.m. One thing to point out as well, if you are coming over to the UK, while almost everything has reopened to some degree since the pandemic, it is always worth checking that things that you may have remembered being open seven days a week are in fact open seven days a week because l there are a number of institutions, big institutions as well, that may not be open all of the days of the week. So 
do make sure you check before you go over there, particularly if you're traveling away to get to them. This does look really fascinating, though. So if anybody gets a chance to go to Nottingham, let us know what you think of that. We have got Holbein at the Tudor Court. This is at the Queen's Gallery at Buckingham Palace. The Again, this is one which has interesting times. So Monday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. With this one, I would recommend booking in advance just to make sure that it's actually open when you want to go and you've got a ticket in hand. But these are the sketches and drawings of Hans Holbein. And they are definitely worth a look. They are absolutely fabulous. So I'm. Oh, I still talk about the Americans not doing panto. I have the impression that America didn't do panto. Yes, we do. My sister is Mrs. Santa Claus every year in a panto. She broke her. Oh, she once broke her rib by falling and landing on her coconut bra in another panto. I mean, that does sound about right. Except, of course, if you were in a UK panto, it would be your brother playing Mrs. Claus because you need a panto dame. I don't, we don't always have Mrs. Claus in a panto. So the one nearest to me, we've, we've, so there, we've got a few. We've got a Jack and the Beanstalk. We've got a Cinderella. We've got a Snow White. Um, they are fabulous. And it's amazing the casts that you get in them. Like, who... They put with who? You have like Olympic gold medalist sports stars beside 70s and 80s pop icons next to somebody who's just been killed off in a soap or who's new in a soap. It's it's everywhere. Judges from Strictly Come Dancing, they're all in it. It is. So a, a pan, so no, it's it's a panto. Well, in the UK, it's it's usually a story like Aladdin, Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, Cinderella, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, then you, then there'll usually be if you do Peter Pan, for example, usually Peter Pan will be played as a breeches role, as in a lovely young lady will play Peter Pan, and. Then there'll be some female character, the Panto Dame, who will be a man in drag, usually in some kind of like old Mother Hubbard bonnet and very, very like silk, like colourful, mismatching silk. So, yes, Biggins as Widow Twanky is the sort of thing we're talking about. And it's high camp and there are like lots of jokes for the kids, but also so much innuendo for the adults. It is some of these pantos are straight filth, <laughs> but it all goes way over the heads of the kids. It is fabulous. Um, and yeah, it's <laughs> it's such good fun. And when uh, Steve, you asked if Gabriel was a bit a lot of pantos are like two hours long. We were thinking about taking him to a panto this year. We are going to take him to a show, but not specifically a panto. When he's a bit older, we are going to do the full panto. And when I tell you, there are pantos everywhere. They all over the place. There, I mean, there's got to be four or five hundred pantos in the UK of varying degrees of professionalism. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a big deal over here. And they usually run from like the end of November all the way through to January. But yes, we, we are here to talk about Holbein at the English court. This is something that I do want to get a chance to go and see. I'm going to try and drag my pal there. Um, but if you've been or if you've got plans to go, let me know what you think. I've heard very good things. And the, the sh I would love to be in a panto. The other thing is there's, a, there's a, the massive, everybody knows in a panto that there'll be a moment where they come on and they'll be like, we can't find so-and-so, wherever could they be? And the thing that they're trying to find or the person they're trying to find is like sneaking out behind them. And everybody in the audience goes, 
it's behind you or she's behind you and so then they they like turn around and it's hidden and there's usually about five minutes of everyone in the auditorium screaming he's behind you um everyone boos the bad guys bad guy bad guys when they appear when they do cinderella usually cinderella's stepmother and the ugly stepsisters are all played by men in like the most lurid it lime green concoction with orange silk outfits <laughs> and there's usually like a, a massive cartoon wart um you know witchy as they can possibly get it's good times and last by no means least the state library of new south wales for all time, Shakespeare in print. This is running to the 25th of February, 2024. This is a exhibition celebrating the 400th anniversary of the first folio. So this is an exhibition marking that. And I think that's going to be fabulous. If you do get a chance to go and see, do let me know what you think. Um, that is what I have for you today. So if you also are thinking of going to a pantomime, let us know what you think. I th from what I'm seeing, I I may have I may have made pantomime sound a bit different because it's it's very clearly aimed at children. It's not the Rocky Horror Picture Show. It's very clearly aimed at ch children. There's usually, you know, a child story traditionally, but the jokes in it are designed to go over the kids' heads and just land at every filthy-minded parent. <laughs> so, um, if you're ever in, if if anybody is, has never been to a panto, and you are in the UK between late November to like early to mid January, get thee to a local theatre and see a pantomime. I promise you shall not regret it. <laughs> they are brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Um, and anything else that I've got to leave? Oh, yes, please do. If, you, if you're if you new here, thank you. I hope you've enjoyed yourself, whether you've been watching live on the playback. Please, please do give this video a like. If you like what I do here, share the video, share my channel. I will, of course, be having a premiere video on Friday. We are going all through December. So, Friday's video is going to be my bookshelf tour. It's been tidied and it now actually sits against the wall. <laughs> Miracle of miracles. Um, and then the following Friday, hopefully, will be my Q&A video finished and uploaded. That will take us into the final week of December and I will see what goes up then. I think it's, it may be – I've got an idea. I'm going to see if I can pull it off and I hope people enjoy it. Our next History News Live will be – uh, in January, so it will be in 2024. So do keep those news items coming to me. I will try and make it shorter than nearly three hours, although it will be more weeks. So we'll have to see, won't we? Um, oh yes, that's that, also that's a very good point for um, accessibility. Most shows and. Uh, heritage sites in the UK do something where it will be free for the carer or some, they, they work out something where there is a discounted price. So do make sure you check that out. Absolutely. Yes, please do subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon, select all when the drop down appears. Also, if you don't get notified about my videos, if you come in late, I don't know how to fix YouTube. It doesn't let me know. Um, but if you go to my website, www.katrinamartian.com and make sure you sign up to my mailing list, I do put out a mail shot um, every week, which includes links to the video. There was also a link to the live, no, sorry, a link to the live if it's going on, but also a link to the promo short. And that will you will get that over a day before anybody else will see it. So it is a little extra sneaky early peek for everybody who has subscribed to the main list. And on top of that, if I'm out and about, mm -hmm. so the last mail shot that went out had a little picture of what I saw at the tower, namely the Christmas decorations, which included a polar bear in a cape. So while that's all happening, I do take pictures and chuck that in 
as well when the mood takes me. So there's little tidbits about my life in addition to all the links. So if you're not getting your links and you want to know more about me, then that is a good place to come because I do put those out every week. But I'm not going to take up any more of your Monday. Thank you all so much for spending this time with me. Thank you if you're watching on the playback. And I look forward to speaking to you all during the premiere of the videos for the rest of December. And I also look forward to our next live, which will be happening in January 2024. As I won't be seeing you all live again, I'm going to wish you all a very happy holidays, a very happy festive season, a Merry Christmas. Whether you celebrate, whatever you celebrate, I do hope that you're going to have a restful time and that you're going to see people that you care about, whether that be your family or your chosen family. And I hope that when I see you in 2024, the year has started beautifully well for all of you, that you had a lovely New Year celebration and that everything that you wish for on that New Year's bell do, does start to come true for you. Well, thank you all so very much. Do take care of yourselves. Not from me. It's bye-bye for now. <laughs>